Half a day, half a day, everyone, and good afternoon. I'd like to uh, first thank all of you for your patience. We were in a special session earlier to address uh, the issue of PFAS contamination on our island. And so I'd like to thank all of you and the public that are watching for their patience with us. Uh, today we are here, the Committee on Education, Air Transportation, and Statistics Research and Planning will now convene this public hearing. It is July 3rd, 2019 at 5.49 p.m. For the record and in accordance with the open government law, public notices were sent out via email to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets on June 26, 2019, and the second notice on June 28, 2019. Notice of today's public hearing was also available on the Guam Legislature's website. I'd like to thank Senator Therese Terlahi, Senators Amanda Shelton, Senator Sabina Perez, Senator Kelly marsh Titano for their presence here today. Uh, today, on today's agenda, we are discussing resolution number 164-35, which is relative to urging for the support of Governor Lourdes Lou Leon Guerrero to call for a pause to clearing pre-construction data recovery and construction activities related to the U.S. Department of the Navy's proposed live fire training range complex at Northwest Field or Tailalu adjacent to Litexan in order to ensure the protection of the environment and historic and cultural resources of the northern coastline of Guam. Before we move forward, I just want to say one thing. Um, in the media, I, I, I believe that there is uh, been a big, um, uh, perhaps a strategy to, to say whether senators are for the military buildup or against the military buildup uh, in reference to this resolution. This resolution addresses the firing range. It does not address, address whether we are for the military buildup or against the military buildup. It addresses the firing range and the policies and the laws that are currently in place that allows for the firing ranges to be built. So after this public hearing, within the next couple of days, my team will be working to bring out committee findings, perhaps to say um, a concurrent standing that perhaps our programmatic agreement needs to be readdressed. Uh, perhaps we need to come together as a community and work with the entities that are working on the firing range to ensure that our environment is protected better. And so we are moving forward with this discussion involving the community. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a matter of uh, a division in our community. We need us as a whole community to speak with one united body so that we can join together and really seek the best solution for our island and its people. And so I want to thank all of you for coming here today. And just I wanted to clear that muddy water. Um, as a senator, there's a lot of political pressure when you, when you um, say you are for the buildup or against the buildup. This is not the issue here. The issue is addressing the impacts of the firing range. And if perhaps the decisions made in the past with the agreements of the programmatic agreement and other, ed and other training um, entities that are moving forward, that perhaps we need to readdress the approach and take a better path that protects our island and its natural resources and the people of Guam. I'd like to uh, now pass it over to Senator Therese Terlahi. She has a presentation she would like to give for the people. Thank you. This will be real quick. I'm just going to put up some slides for those who are watching, um, especially at home and who have never seen these slides. And so these are been presented to me in my capacity as chairperson of uh, historic preservation. So in the programmatic agreement, which is what uh, the DOD and, and uh, SHPO's office have uh, entered into, uh, when they find um, materials and sites or areas where they have agreed to recover, data recovery means the removal of a sampling of archeologically relevant material among other things, Lati, Lusong, earth ovens, pottery pieces, etc. This is a definition from the programmatic agreement. Thank you. All right, this map is, uh, it's of the of, of Retidian Point, of, and the blue areas show 
the firing, the, the five planned firing ranges. The four on the right of the screen are the ones that are um, in progress right now, being uh, clearing and other things are in progress. The fifth one has not yet been, uh, has not begun. This map shows uh, the little green circles. It talks about, well, the X's show the 14 historic sites that have been removed via data recovery. The, the small circles show other known historic sites that, uh, that are not yet removed. Thank you. This shows, um, this is a map that talks about uh, special status species observations. So it talks, uh, there's a list, and so it indicates uh, Mariana fruit bat, Mariana fruit bat roosting habitat, Mariana eight spot butterfly, Guam tree snail, Mariana eight spot butterfly host plant, Mariana wandering butterfly host plant, Serianthus nelsoni, uh, Taber montana rotendi, Psychotria malaspinae. Those are flora, sorry if I mispronounced those. But so those shows the location of these endangered plants uh, in the firing range areas. All right, that's, that's the tree, that, the picture of it uh, for this. All right, next screen, please. This is just an overview of um, the sensitive marine biological resources and the nearshore habitat. And the dotted yellow lines show the surface danger zones for the five different firing ranges. Uh, it's hard to see, but the, the dotted lines, again, they show the firing ranges themselves. Those are up on a cliff, Retidian is below, and then the surface danger zones that go out towards the ocean. Um, the, this is one map of inadvertent discoveries. On one of those five firing ranges, this is, this is one of them, uh, kind of blown up. So I... Um, Yeah, so these, um, the SHPO was recently notified of at least three more inadvertent, meaning they didn't know about this before they began clearing, discoveries of additional historic sites made during clearing of the forests. One with at least 400 pieces of pottery found in a dense area and the other area encompassing seven acres. So I think the red area is like a seven acre area that they're now studying and the pink areas were the sites of, of the other two findings. So this is three in this one firing range. This... Uh, All right, I don't, I'm sorry, I, I thought I had the exact uh, square miles of this firing range, but I, I do not. There's a total on the, on the live fire training ranges of um, 187 acres of limestone forest habitat at Northwest Field that, that they intend to clear. There's a, uh, that's in addition to the clearing at uh, Finnegodson and other areas, Andy South, Anderson Air Force Base, and uh, the biological opinion report showed a total of 1,219 acres. But for this firing range, of the firing ranges, it shows 187. All right. Sorry. This is the most recent that I'm aware of uh, discovery, of an uh, inadvertent discovery. This is on the road uh, that they are creating between those firing ranges, the smaller firing ranges. So the red marks the spot of where they had another discovery, and that was a basalt, basalt lusong and plentiful lati period ceramics. That's how it was described in one of the documents. I think that's all I've got for today. I know many of you have a lot more material, but I just wanted to give a very view overview and some visuals. Thank you, Senator Terlahi. The purpose of the presentation is to bring the community along because many of our community members, um, we, we don't know the history. Uh, we're not familiar with the history, the impacts it has caused. 
the square miles that it covers and so the and also the immensity of the firing ranges and the um, species and the cultural sites that are being impacted. So we'd like to move forward with our roster to call the various speakers up and acknowledge their presence. Elsa, I'm sorry, it's so... <laughs> Elsa, please come forward. Uh, Dr. Lisa Natividad, Julia Faye Minos, Attorney Jonathan Bell, uh, Sedfried Lungsanen, Christine Delgado, Francine Napati, um, E. Montecalvo, Victoria Leon Guerrero, Inetnan Leon Guerrero. Jessica, Jessica Nangata, Desiree Ventura, to come forward and give testimony. Monica Flores. Uh, Boy Suzuki. Okay. We'll move forward. Um, perhaps also we can start with you and then just work down to your right. Please, for the record, state your name um, and your perhaps your expertise, and then please give your testimony. Thank you very much. My name is Elsa de Meulenaren. I'm an ecologist and an interdisciplinary PhD candidate with a specialization in conservation genetics, ethnobotany, and policy. I'm the Associate Director for Natural Resources with the Center for Island Sustainability at the University of Guam. The views and statements presented in this testimony, testimony are personal and do not represent the universities I'm affiliated with. I'm in support of the Bill 164-35 to call for a pause to clearing pre-construction data recovery and construction activities at the proposed live fire training range at Northwest Field. First, I would like to clarify why building a live fire training range complex at Northwest Field would jeopardize the last critically endangered Serianthus nelsoni or Hudson Lago and its critical habitat. The area proposed, first of all, the area proposed to be used for the multi-purpose machine gun range will fragment the conservation area identified as critical habitat for fruit bats, the Guam Micronesian Kingfisher, and the Mariana Craw. This primary limestone forest with unique geological karst features provides habitat for different endemic species, species which only occur on Guam or the Mariana Islands and nowhere else in the world. These habitats and species are part of Guam's natural heritage. Endemic species often occur in small numbers, making them more vulnerable to extinction. In addition, island ecosystems evolved over time with only competition from few other species and have therefore survival strategies based on interdependency and coevolution rather, rather than competition. A healthy habitat is therefore key to their survival. Endemic species on islands have increasingly been threatened by development. One of these endemics is Serianthus nelsoni, or Hudson Lago. Serianthus nelsoni grows on limestone and volcanic areas, but the last adult tree producing seed is located at the Northwest Field or Talalo area in a limestone forest which should be protected to establish a healthy Serianthus nelsoni population. Secondly, currently seedlings emerge in the direct vicinity of the Serianthus nelsoni tree because the 30 feet exclosure surrounding the tree protects the seedlings from deer and prick predation. One larger seedling is currently growing within the fence and protected from insect pests. 
Aliopedic effects on germination, growth, and development of seedlings have not been scientifically proven. In Rhoda, adult trees are currently spaced between 30 and 100 feet apart. And Wiles et al. stated in his publication that the regeneration of this tree occurs near existing trees. He mentions that Mariana fruit bat feeds on its flowers and may assist in pop pollination, which actually makes the noise of a live fire and training range an additional concern for the fruit bent's occurrence in that forest. Given all these facts, it is recommended to increase the size of the 30 feet exclosure to allow seedlings to grow, for grow further away from the tree. And that way, the wild population at that size can gradually increase and become a valid, healthy population that can be established there. Thirdly, before I address the 100 feet buffer, it is worth mentioning that the seedlings and saplings outplanted at the Guam Wildlife Refuge and other locations in Guam will take between five and 10 years before they will produce if they survive the different insect pests. Therefore, it is important that we keep the last adult tree, even though its health is declining, alive as long as possible because the tree keeps providing seeds required for the very valuable recovery, act, recovery actions. After the proposed clearing of the forest, only a hundred feet buffer of the, on the eastern side of the mother tree will remain, they say, which will increase the likelihood of damage through storm activity. The recovery plan of Sarianthus Nelsoni, published by the US Fish and Wildlife in 1994 states, uh, start uh, prevent clearing of forest next to the Sarianthus Nelsoni tree at uh, Retidium Point. A little further, it mentions maintenance of an intact forest canopy next to the Sarianthus Nelsoni tree will reduce the potential for high winds during typhoons to break limbs and trunks. End of quotation. I have seen healthy wild populations of Sarianthus in Micronesia, mostly in Yap and Palau. Outplanted trees also thrive in urban settings, even along roadsides or forest edges, but a healthy wild population needed for the recovery of the species of Guam need to be surrounded by a healthy forest in order to thrive. Given the fact that our last Hudson Lago tree is not in good health, the production of a forest around the protection of a forest around the tree is warranted. Fourthly, for my PhD research, I'm currently conducting a phylogenetic study. The genetic makeup of Serianthus is currently unknown. Serianthus occurs in Rhoda, Guam, Yap, and Palau. Beyond Micronesia, it also occurs naturally in New Caledonia, French Polynesia, and other Pacific islands. This phylogenetic study will investigate the relatedness of Serianthus trees from Guam, Rhoda, and other specific islands. If genetic differences between the Guam and Rhoda trees are detected, this phylogenetic tree will determine if the genetic difference is large enough to call it a different species compared to the overall genetic diversity within the genus. If the trees from Guam and Rhoda are distinct, this might require different management strategies to protect and maintain the genetic diversity of these populations. Secondly, the recent discovery of more cultural artifacts at Hailalo shows the need to protect these forests and let them stay in tune with their past. Thirdly, the accessibility, protection, and respect for the sacred lands at Letetzen is another reason not to build a live fire training range complex. The people of Guam still connect with their ancestors at Letetzen, find peace and rest, and enjoy its waters. Kids go on field trips and learn about their history and connect with their past, visit the caves and ladder villages in their natural environment. Fishermen still fish the deep waters and so Amte still today collect Amot. My PhD research also aims to document the ethnobotanical knowledge of Letetzen and will inform decision makers about the need to protect sacred places such as Letetzen. Lastly, I want to advise to think long term because there's a lot at stake. This limestone forest interwoven with a rich culture heritage above the cliff lines of Letailalo won't be recoverable anymore once we allow its clearance. When the lands and the waters to Letetzen are closed, our eyes won't be able to see and our minds won't be able to connect 
with what is most sacred to the Tato Tano. Protehi hi alantano zanitazi ikutura, este na lugad guaha at antigun. Sismas. Thank you, Elsa. It's pretty good tomorrow. <laughs> Dr. Natividad. Buenas and half a day, everyone. This testimony is presented on behalf of the Guahan Coalition for Peace and Justice. I am Lisa Linda Natividad, president of our coalition. We thank you for this opportunity to present testimony in absolute support of resolution number 164-35. I know that we're focusing on the environmental issue at the moment, but we really do need to contextualize what's happening now in the larger context of the entire military buildup. So in 2009, the Guahan Coalition for Peace and Justice submitted a 30-page testimony to the DOD in response to the release of the DEIS, standing in opposition to the Guam military buildup. Our testimony largely contained concerns related to the US DOD plans to do the following dredge nearly 72 acres of live coral reef to construct a bigger berthing for nuclear submarines, drill an additional 22 wells into our northern water aquifer, erect a missile defense system, now referred to as a THAAD, acquire an additional 2,200 acres of land for the construction of bases, increasing the DOD's land holdings on island to roughly 42%, increasing the island's population by almost 80,000 people, which accounted for about a 51% population increase, desecration of Pocket Village to construct the live firing range complex at the time, and ultimately continue to defer the exercise of our right to political self-determination. The Department of Defense reported that approximately 10,000 testimonies were submitted, which was unprecedented in US DOD history. Also unprecedented was the nearly 1,100 page document that we were expected to review within 90 days. Our island's collective response addressed concerns related to the impact of the military buildup on Guam's frail infrastructure to include utilities, water, wastewater systems, the negative impacts on our environment, our cultural properties, increased traffic, strain on our local hospital, to name a few. None of our concerns were addressed in the release of the final environmental impact statement in July of 2010. None. In examining the impact of the planned military buildup on Guahan and on our lives, it really begs the question, why are these Marines being relocated from Okinawa to Guahan anyway? The Okinawan people have resisted the US military presence for decades, particularly infuriated by the sex crimes committed against women and girls by US service members. For example, in 1995, three US service members raped and brutally beat a 12-year-old uh, schoolgirl, which resulted in public outrage and protests. Given this pattern of behavior, why would we welcome an increased presence of US military members? The primary reason given for the support of the US military buildup on Guahan has been for economic reasons. I hope to address directly this fallacy for the bulk of my testimony here, because no amount of economic gain is worth the destruction of our physical environment. In examining the testimony presented by Catherine Castro of the Guam Chamber of Commerce dated October 5th of 2017, she cites a poll conducted in April of 2017 by QMark Research that presents the general perception of Guam residents indicating that nearly 70% are in favor of the Guam buildup. This figure is no surprise considering that as a community, there have been no substantive information presented other than that which is generated by mainstream media propelling the Guam Chamber of Commerce position that the buildup is good for the island and its economy. This is, there is also no surprise that over 80% of Guam residents felt that the buildup would contribute to more jobs and tax revenues because again, this is what they have been told by local media and by the Guam Chamber of Commerce. The findings of the cited poll conducted by QMark Research are merely a regurgitation of our uninformed community's perceptions. This does not constitute necessary data and research to evidence that the Guam military buildup benefits our local economy. Rather, this is a mere reflection of our community's perceptions. The more relevant question to ask here is what, what position 
do people who have actually researched this issue maintain? As a, fa as a faculty in the Division of Social Work at the University of Guam, I have co-organized a multitude of public fora and conferences examining this issue. We cannot simply take the Guam Chamber of Commerce report as fact when it really is not supported by hard data examining military bases and their economic impacts on their surrounding base communities. I would like to introduce three economic case studies to this end. The first is the base community in Okinawa, Japan. Okinawa bears the burden of 75% of US military forces stationed in Japan. Some of these bases include camps Hansen and Schwab, Futema and Kadena and Zama Air bases. Considering that Okinawa has the greatest concentration of the US military members, you would expect that its military power economy would be one of the most robust in the country. However, the contrary is true. Okinawa is the poorest of all Japan prefectures. In 1972, after the reversion of Okinawa from the US to Japan, the US military economy contributed 15.5% of the gross prefectural income. However, by 2008, this figure was reduced to a mere 5.3% of revenues. In the same year, 2008, 10.9% of revenue was generated from tourism, more than double that of US forces related revenues. The second economic case study was conducted by Dr. Catherine Lutz in her book titled Home Front, A Military City in the American 20th Century, published in 2001. Dr. Lutz, who also is the person that introduced the whole concept of PFOS to our community, is a faculty from Brown University and a co-director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. She has visited Guahan several times in the past few years with an interest in the island's experience with militarism. In her book, The Base Community of Fayetteville, North Carolina, that hosts the Army Base Fort Bragg, she examines very um, specifically. Fayetteville has commonly been referred to as Fatalville and Vietnam for its negative outcomes in terms of violence and growth income inequalities. Lutz reported that the military is not the best sector to lead to the development of jobs. She reported that military spending is one of the least efficient job creation engines that exist. More precisely, for a billion dollars, that leads to the creation of a mere 26,000 military jobs. The same billion dollars will create either 37,000 healthcare jobs or 48,000 jobs in the arena of education. Given this data, we must ask ourselves, what do we need more of in our community? Military personnel, healthcare workers, or educators? Investing a billion dollars will result in the creation of 48,000 education jobs as compared to just 26,000 military jobs. Where would you choose to invest our resources? Dr. Lutz described Fayetteville's economy as containing one gigantic firm, the military. As we know, the presence of a military base influences a community's wages, benefits, working conditions, and development opportunities. Lutz reported that Vayaville had lower wages due to high competition for jobs with retirees and military dependents when compared to other areas of North Carolina. She also reported a loss of tax dollars through exemptions for federal land and consumer goods sold on base. She further went on to describe how reduced property taxes impact public education, with Fayetteville spending the least per child in the North Carolina school system. In addition, military members and their families use public resources provided by the local government with no supporting tax base. Lutz also reported that for younger military families, participating in social service programs such as WIC and SNAP made these services less available to non-military families in Fayetteville. Lastly, Fayetteville was noted for having one of the state's highest rates of child poverty and infant mortality. And she quoted, I'm quoting her as she stated in her book, while Fayetteville's military dependency has made fortunes for some, its economy was increasingly based on selling goods and services to soldiers, creating retail jobs that pay less than any other category of work. Despite the egalitarian pay and strong benefit packages military work brings to town, Overall, the installation established a low wage economy, a vulnerable labor force of dependent women and teens, the high crime rates that come with poverty, and a weak democratic culture and public sphere. 
Lutz did mention one group who benefited from the military presence in Fayetteville, namely shop owners who sold goods not found on base. It is from this limited and narrow perspective that the Guam Chamber of Commerce supports the military buildup so that their respective businesses can increase their profitability. And those businesses will indeed make money and benefit from the military buildup. But what you must ask yourselves is what will be the cumulative impact of the military buildup on our economy? While examining the dollars and cents in a balance sheet informs one part of the equation, we must also consider the social costs of this military buildup. Of the projected 45,000 people to influx into our island, only a fraction of that number will be military members and their dependents. A significant proportion of that number will be foreign labor workers, contractors, and contractors' family members. This population will only be able to avail of social services outside of the military fences. Because they are not active duty military personnel, for example, they will seek medical care in our local hospitals and clinics. This will place a significant strain on our already ailing healthcare system that is barely able to meet the needs of our existing population. So these social costs also need to be taken into consideration when determining the cumulative economic impacts of the military buildup. The idea of losing military presence is a scary one for many people. It is in this vein that, that I present a third case study of a post-military economy in Subic Bay Freeport in the Philippines. In 1991, the US withdrew its military bases from the Philippines, leaving behind its toxic waste and rubbish. Since then, the Philippines has transformed the same locale into a thriving economic development project. The Supic Bay Metropolitan Authority reported the amount of economic activity in US dollars, along with the number of jobs created between the years of 1992 and 2012. In 1992, the year immediately following the closure of bases, it reported 5.5 million and the creation of 622 jobs. By the year 2008, this figure had increased to 249 million and 7,303 jobs. This was followed by the most lucrative year reported in 2010, generating $1.2 billion and 8,050 jobs. This data clearly gives hope for the development of alternatives to military-based economies. These three case studies of Okinawa, Japan, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Subic Bay in the Philippines should cast some doubt to the rhetoric and myth of military money that supposedly comes from hosting military bases. In 2010, Dr. Claret Rowan, an economist at the University of Guam, released a technical report from the Pacific Center for Economic Initiatives titled, Macroeconomic Multipliers, the Case of Guam. In her paper, she analyzed the economic projections of the DEIS related, released in 2009 on the Guam military buildup. Ruran critiqued the use of the Hawaii macroeconomic multiplier figures to project the economic impact of the Guam military buildup. In particular, she stated that the significant difference in the scale of economies between Guam and Hawaii make it an inappropriate application. In her paper, she did two things. First, she took a standard spending multiplier and presented a conceptual framework for how to adjust it to better reflect Guam's specific economic conditions. Second, she criticized the current practice of using Hawaii's multiplier in analysis of Guam's economy, and because of a lack of Guam data, could only hypothesize, not verify, that Guam's spending multiplier is lower than Hawaii's. This implies that economic impact studies that use Hawaii's spending multiplier tend to present a rosier picture of the po positive economic impacts of proposed changes. It then takes the most recent study of this type, the DEIS, and adjusts spending multiplier calculations using a lower, more accurate spending multiplier for Guam. Ruan's study is a call to question the accuracy of the figures provided in these NEPA statements. Further studies are needed before it can be determined that the planned military buildup will positively impact our local economy. Clearly, our current political status has undermined our rights as peoples to influence and effectuate plans in our community. We must always remind ourselves that our current relationship with the US is not one that is based on love. We are a pawn used in the geopolitical chess game of the US. There is not enough time in this public hearing to dissect the notion that militarism results in the promotion of peace, for quite frankly, it does the opposite. 
History reminds us on Guahan that the presence of U.S. military bases warrants us unsafe and vulnerable to attack. The recent North Korea threats directed to Guahan and her people illustrates this unequivocally. As legislators of this esteemed body, I highly encourage you to reflect on the strategies that bring peace into our hearts and into our lives. Peace is neither obtained nor maintained through acts of war or carrying guns. Peace is generated through mutual respect, diplomacy, and acts of kindness and love. In closing, we, with the Guahan Coalition for Peace and Justice, urge all members of Ilegislatura in Guahan to support this resolution, which will serve as a record that we as a community did indeed stand up for our rights and do not support the Guam military buildup, nor its destruction of our sacred sites and environment. Sidzu Usmasi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Natividad. I'd like to, at this time, recognize Senator Regine Biscoli's presence and also Senator Tello Tairagui. Thank you, Senators, for being here. Sisu um, Asmasi, Hafade. My name is Julia Feminoz, and I speak in my capacity, capacity as a community member and member of community organizations in support of Resolution 164-35 and in support of a halt to the military buildup. As described in Resolution 164-35 and in numerous forms of legislation, advocacy, and assessments provided by relevant entities, including DOD, the military construction and buildup holds devastating environmental and cultural consequences for our island and people. The destruction of historical and cultural sites and the decimation of limestone forests that threaten the endangered species, such as the Hudson Lagu tree at Tailatlua and other sites, hold an irreversible cost and are in direct violation of our indigenous rights to protect and defend these sacred spaces. The apparent effects of the military buildup greatly contradict DOD's claims as a leader in environmental stewardship. This lack of commitment on DOD's part does not solely concern the construction at Tailatluk, but also their role in the contamination of our island's drinking water from the use of PFAS. I would like to stress to this body the role that the ongoing buildup will play in the future contamination of PFAS by DOD. Per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, are a large family of man-made chemicals used in a variety of consumer products and industries globally. They comprise as many as 4,700 chemicals, if not more, and ongoing data and research will, may also reveal additional PFAS. Current studies suggest that exposure to PFAS may increase the risk of various cancers, decrease fertility in women, adversely impact the growth and development of infants and children, and compromise the immune system, liver, and thyroid function. PFAS do not break down typically in the environment and accumulate in the human body over time. Because PFAS persist in the environment and in the human body for years, continuous exposure can lead to high levels of accumulation. Of all the PFAS exposure pathways, including but not limited to PFAS contaminated foods and soils, contaminated drinking water poses a particular threat, as our most vulnerable populations of pregnant and breastfeeding women, children, and babies are the most susceptible to accumulation and drink higher concentrations of water. As such, PFAS contaminated drinking water is of grave concern to our island and people, as evident by various PFAS mitigating agency and community initiatives and, legis and legislation that is as recent as the last few days. PFAS, particularly PFOS and PFHXS, have been detected in our island's drinking water at levels ranging as high as 410 parts per trillion far above the U.S. EPA's health advisory level at 70 parts per trillion during the U.S. EPA's UCMR3 monitoring cycle in 2014 to 2015 and again in 2016. Among our public water systems, wells NAS1, A23, and A25 tested for particularly high levels of PFOS ranging in the hundreds, a type of PFOS commonly associated with DOD activities, such as the use of PFOS-rich firefighting foam or AFFF. 
In the initial resampling conducted by GWA in 2016, PFAS levels measured at 120 parts per trillion for A23 and at 220 parts per trillion for A25. It is no coincidence that in NAS1, A23, and A25 are located at or near the formal naval air station NAS in Tizen, where past military activities can most definitely be linked to PFAS contamination. Our local government and GWA continue to address PFAS in their respective capacities as NAS1 is continuously being filtered and A23 and A25 remain offline, but these are costly processes that have not yet been properly compens compensated by DOD. Apart from Guam, communities across the nation have experienced PFAS contamination as a, as a result of DOD's actions. Since the 1970s, DOD has been identified as one of the most frequent users of PFAS. According to a September 2018 report by the Governor's Accountability Office, uh, DOD has identified 401 active or closed military installations with known or suspected releases of PFOS and PFOA. Facing billions of dollars in cleanup, DOD has pushed for weaker re regulations on PFAS and has even delayed the US EPA in its effort to address PFAS. In a March 2019 correspondence between Delaware Senator Tom Carper and US EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler, it was revealed that DOD, alongside NASA and the SBA, disputed the finalization of US EPA's groundwater cleanup guidelines for PFOS and PFOA, a set of guidelines that had been held up for a year. In the dispute, DOD and other agencies have pushed for the adoption of a much higher 400 parts per trillion cleanup standard and a 1,200 parts per trillion emergency level, far above the EPA's draft proposed cleanup guidelines at the USPA's advisory level of 70 parts per trillion and emergency level of 400 parts per trillion. The push by DOD and other responsible parties would subject fewer sites to PFAS remediation. Furthermore, DOD has pushed that these levels be treated individually and not in their individual or combined sums. According to the letter, DOD continues to refuse to remediate PFOS contamination unless PFOA and PFOS levels exceed their personally prescribed 400 parts per trillion. Apart from their obstinance to adopt more stringent cleanup standards that would imply greater accountability on their behalf, DOD has also not completely eliminated the use of aqueous film-forming foam. Communities across the nation continue to struggle with holding DOD accountable for their role in PFAS contamination, and states such as New Mexico have even entered into litigation with DOD. If DOD blatantly refuses to engage in the remediation and mitigation of PFAS, chemicals of global concern, how can we trust that they have interest in our island and people in the ongoing construction and buildup? How can we trust that DOD's actions at Tailatlo will not lead to further PFAS contamination at this site through their use of industrial applications that may contain PFAS? DOD has already indicated through its violation of legal procedures and destructive action that will continue to operate in a way that is of the highest benefit to their operations. Let us not allow such actions to extend to further health and environmental impacts on our people. Sizu Asmaasi. Thank you, Julia. Mr. Linsangan. Um, good evening, Senators. My name is Sedfri Linsangan. I have no expertise. Uh, I'm a Filipino, Gomenian, American. Why I'm here? Because this is about preservation of uh, history. Artifacts. I have read three books regarding Guam history. And it was noted there that almost 3,500 years ago, the first people that came here are from Indonesia, Taiwan, and the Philippines. And their language is the Austronesian language. They bring their costumes, their cultures, and that's where the tomorrow evolves. The Spanish and the Americans just came 200 years ago. Now, in regards to this, uh, to this resolution, I oppose this resolution for 
temporary stopping the, uh, the sites. I agree with the uh, Governor Lulion Guerrero in her uh, position that we need to uh, revisit the programmatic agreement. The uh, SHPO is the one in charge and uh, there needs to be consultation and this is one step. That's why I would like to thank all of you for also Senator Nelson for, for writing this resolution because this is one step to initiate a dialogue with uh, Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield. The military was very clear without, without the live firing training exercises, they will not make the build-up. And that includes all the build-up, even in the bases. In regards to the uh, economic development, yes, the mainland contractors are not paying taxes, but they are hiring subcontractors, local subcontractors that hire local employees. And most of the Locals have their own company, especially in, in heavy equipment, clearing. Now your concern is, is valid. And uh, I believe what we should do is re revisit and stick with the programmatic agreement and address all the concern, raise all the concern to the uh, rear admiral. In fact, this is not in case the, the governor, Lou, Leon Guerrero, whatever, her discretion that is not favorable to this resolution, you still have the right as per organic of Guam. You can do your own initiation with the uh, rear admiral because pursuant to uh, section 1423K, the right to petition the legislature or any person or group of person in Guam shall have the right to petition. It shall be the duty of all officers of the government, whether it's US or Guam, to accept without delay to act upon or forward as the case may require any such petition. That's why Senators, even, even the governor don't approve this resolution, move forward if you believe that they have violation. You, know, you have all the right to, uh, to get a dialogue with the, uh, with the uh, base commander or with, or with the commander of the Marianas, Rear Admiral Chatfield. Because just like the African proverb say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go with the team. In this case, why you don't have to, why you have to wait with the governor if he is not willing to uh, to address your concern or to paper your resolution. Well, even I agree with her. You know, it's up to you now to to raise your issue. It could be valid or not, but the responsibility here is with the. SHPO. Is she, is she doing, are they doing their job? Because it's very clear here. The pro programmatic agreement is a contract that demands the parties SHPO and DOD to comply with the process that includes consultation, review, and compliance concerning historic preservation laws and outline environmental responsibilities of the military concerning the impacts of training activities on Guam. That's why all we got to do is meet with the uh, DOD officers. Because as far as I know, with the way I read the books, if there is artifacts found in the job site, then you need an archaeologist to 
to monitor, to excavate carefully the sites, not temporarily shut down the sites. Because this is an opening now for, for Guam. Because without, without the, uh, that construction, you'll never discover. You'll never find that there are historic preservation there, historic artifacts that is important to, to our heritage. You know, that's, that's why this is also a blessing in disguise. And now, how, how are you going to preserve it? See? Then it's up to you guys now how to, what is the proper procedures to transfer everything or excavate carefully to take out all the artifacts like the pottery, the shell tools, the jewelry, and anything that you can find there that belongs to our ancestors. Because just like the, uh, I would like to uh, state the uh, national hero of the Philippines, Dr. Jose Rizal. He who does not look back where he came from will never get to his destination. He who does not love his own language is worse than the animal or his smelly fish. That's why Stick with the programmatic agreement. Raise your concern. Whatever it takes, go for it. Thank you, Senators. Thank you, Mr. Lasongan. Um, Attorney Jonathan Bell. Uh, good evening, Senators. Uh, my name is John Richard Bradalio Bell. Uh, I have a, a philosophy degree from San Diego State, a law degree from California Western School of Law, I'm a private practice attorney. Uh, mostly I do labor rights. I also do personal injury, consumer issues. Basically, I represent the little people that typically don't have the money, power, and influence as, as some others. Thank you for the opportunity to submit my personal comments. I don't pretend to be an expert on this issue or even have specific solutions. I wish I did. I get that there are costs and benefits on each side, but I always appreciate the senators willing to take a stand for something that they believe in over purely economic interests or political gain. I'm all for pragmatism, but let's not pretend that we as a community will be happy if we all sell our souls for cash. This, that never leads to true or long-term happiness. And let's not forget that we have a long and dismal history of being economically exploited by outside interest groups who don't have to live with our consequences. I am far from anti-military or anti-business. My father was a South Dakota farm boy who came here in the Navy. My brother and, and I are also Navy vets, and my sister is now in our local Army National Guard. I recently served two years as a volunteer for the employer support for the Guard and Reserve. As a small business owner, I understand that nothing is free. But as we discuss not if, but how to best do this military buildup, let us not trade our irreplaceable historical and cultural identity for temporary and short-sighted economic benefits. My mom grew up during the World War II era when speaking Chamorro was discouraged, so it hampered her ability to teach her own kids their cultural language. She didn't speak Chamorro well, and sadly, I know very little. But that did not stop my mom from aligning herself with the Chamorro Nation and speaking up about causes that she believed in. I am proud to have voted for Angel Santos and wish we were he were still around to help guide us today. If my mom were alive, she would be pleased to know I have made at least some effort to ensure the language is taught to my own three kids. Because it's not too late for us to go learn our language, but it doesn't work that way with cultural sites and artifacts, does it? Once we lose them, we lose them forever. I only ask that we don't lose sight of that. A few brief, brief comments on some other things would be that, you know, when I was in the Navy, I. I left island in 2002, came back in 2012, I noticed how much the island had changed in, in 10 years. I saw the boom. And what, what I noticed that it wasn't big box stores coming to Guam, it was everyday mom and pop. It was local entrepreneurs you know, on Guam just de developing small businesses, you know, uh, grassroots root style, if you will. And that, doesn't, that was not the military buildup that, that caused that to happen. Um, I was briefly on the WIOA board, which was the Workforce Innovation uh, Opportunity Act board. And one thing that, that kind, of, kind of bothered me about the way that 
the board looked at things. You know, it's essentially, uh, in plain English, the whole point was to look at developing our workforce from a macro, national, and local level. And what really bothered me was that it was all about how we can deliver up workers to the business community. Now, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But there didn't seem to be really a whole lot of interest in what's actually good for our local workers. It was sort of a one-sided deal, kind of how, you know, unfortunately, I think some the military buildup can be that way. I'm also a member of the Chamber of Commerce. I certainly don't speak for them. Um, I wouldn't be, you know, a member if I, if I was ideologically opposed to, to what they stand for. But I definitely will say that they, they, you know, being the chamber, they don't necessarily represent the interests of everyday people. And so I, I have no problem speaking out against the chamber when I disagree, which I, I often do. Um, and the last thing I was, basically I just want to say that I support this bill. I thank everybody for their, their time, for letting me have, share my perspective, and I encourage you to keep fighting the good fight. Thank you, Attorney Brown. Hola. Uh, half a day, Senators. Thank you so much uh, for having us here today to offer our thoughts on this wonderful resolution. Uh, Guahusi Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. Um, I am a member, an active member of Independent Guahan um, and the co chairperson for the Independence for Guam Task Force. Um, and I speak today as predominantly as a mother who has deep love for the area that is being most affected by um, the construction of the live fire training range complex. Um, I'm here to offer full support for resolution 16435 and actually I'd like to commend the authors of this resolution for um, your thorough coverage of um, what is happening and the urgency behind the need for a halt to the construction of the live fire training range complex. Um, for over a decade, we have been saying the exact same thing at dozens of scoping meetings, public hearings, legislative hearings, congressional, <laughs> everything. It has been the exact same message from our community that we do not want the destruction of our environment. We do not want the destruction of our cultural resources. We do not um, feel that this buildup is beneficial to our community, and I think even the, the word buildup is inaccurate. It is a destruction and we are seeing it happen already. And so for many of us who have been vocal for over a decade, um, driving up north to visit the Texan is absolutely heartbreaking and devastating considering that the community has been very clear that this is not what we want. Um, and I think that for me personally, I've always been very clear that I am opposed to um, this militarization, this most recent effort to further militarize our island, um, purely because we do not have consent. So whether people support or don't support the buildup is irrelevant because the buildup continues to move forward despite the community's concerns, uh, despite the wonderful efforts of legislators like yourself who continuously draft resolutions that expressly state the, the needs and the concerns of our community from as early on as the first DEIS to um, every single military document we've seen and had to comment on since. Um, people have called it build up burnout. Many of us have, um, there, there are some here that have been at every single thing and others have had to take a step away because it's disempowering to continue to articulate these concerns and still hear the exact same divisive conversations in our media, in our community, um, that are driven by misinformation um, and meant to villainize those who deeply love our island. I was incredibly disappointed that uh, a lot of the reaction from the, the local media to um, over 26 groups writing to and meeting with the governor um, and presenting powerful testimony as to reasons why they believe that this live fire training range complex needs to be stopped um, was classified as a group of angry and hateful people because having been in that room even when voices were raised I truly believe that it came from a place of deep love for this island for our people for our history our culture and especially for our future and so I wanted to say that today because I know that efforts like this are not rooted in hate or anger. It, they're rooted in love and genuine concern. 
And I, I really wanted to express that today because um, we love our island. Our island is, is Guahan. It means we have. We have a beautiful home that is provided for us for nearly 4,000 years. And what we're seeing today is the destruction of these things that have provided for us for so long. The thousands of acres of limestone forests that we lose because of this buildup. The already destroyed limestone forests um, that you can just drive by and see that is gone. That we will never get back. And no, the economic gains are not worth it. Yes, they are very temporary. Even the ones that were just provided as examples in, this, in the few testimonies you've heard of you know, construction contracts or subcontracts, those jobs are very temporary. The destruction is permanent. And I'd actually like to cite uh, Senator Sabina Perez, who recently I had the privilege of being on a, a program with, who, who pointed out that as a people, when we look at our economy, are we really benefiting our community by looking at short-sighted solutions that lead to such devastation and destruction to our environment? Or should we be thinking about economic opportunities and possibilities that will continue to flourish our environment and our community and, and allow us to sustain ourselves uh, for much longer than this militarization uh, will give us? And so I think that um, the destruction of our environment it absolutely has to stop. And in the plans for this live fire training range complex, it has always been clear that we would lose our native limestone forests. In the environmental impact statements, which are drafted um, predominantly by people who are not here, um, they label that as less than significant impact, and their mitigation is to revive a forest elsewhere. That is not sufficient for our community. And the United Nations, the world, which is the body that is to represent other countries throughout the world, has stated very clearly in repeated resolutions that um, people in non-self-governing territories must consent when their natural resources, must be given consent when their natural resources are going to be destroyed. It is our right to have the ability to protect our natural resources for future generations. The destruction of our, our limestone forest for a firing range is in direct violation of that right. And it's a right that has been taken away from us by the United States, as we can see through over 10 years of public testimony against it, and still it is happening today. In terms of the destruction of our historical, cultural, and sacred sites and artifacts, um, that is absolutely unacceptable. We as a Chamorro people, no matter where these, um, these resources are found, uh, have the right to protect them. A lot of the, the speak in the media lately has been that it's, it's the military's property and they can do what they want with it. But this is our history and we have to protect it. And yes, there have been violations by um, businesses and landowners and all kinds of other, the government have, have disturbed sites like this in the past. Does that mean that we then justify the continued destruction or do we as a community say enough has occurred that it needs to stop no matter who is doing it? And this is something I urge you as, as lawmakers is we need to strengthen our historic preservation laws. It's, it's a non-negotiable. Um, but again, how do we continue to strengthen our laws but not have them apply in instances like this where we are told repeatedly by the admiral, who I don't think is someone we can even negotiate with, she doesn't have power, she has clearly expressed that no matter what, they're going to keep construction going and that there will be adverse impacts to these resources in order for them to fulfill their mission. We need to go beyond that. We need to say this is not acceptable. Many of our groups that were asked to sign, almost all the groups that were asked to sign on to the programmatic agreement objected to that and refused to sign on to it because it does not function to protect our cultural resources. It justifies the removal of them from their original place. That hampers and hinders our ability to truly learn about the history contained in these spaces. Um, the reason why I support a halt to this completely is that these sites that were discovered inadvertently by bulldozers um, 
we'll not, we will never be able to go back and properly see how they were in their original form. If we come in after the fact to look at the, the pieces that have been moved aside, um, who knows what information we lost? Who knows um, what it was like prior to its environment around it being destroyed by bulldozers? This is why it can't just be a pause to the areas where artifacts have already been found because guaranteed as construction continues, more sites will be discovered in this very disrespectful and haphazard way and we will not be able to go in and carefully examine them. So even if an archaeologist comes in after the fact, it doesn't erase the damage that's already been done and the damage just needs to stop. It's evident that this space has too, ma too many cultural artifacts and sites present for this to continue. And we have always been clear about that. And so I support this resolution and I call for a halt altogether, not just a pause, but it needs to stop. This is not a space where a firing range belongs especially in light of where we are at as a community and in terms of our values as a people, it's counter to what we believe as a people to shoot guns, machine guns and various rifles in a sacred place like Litexen and Tailalu and all the other spaces around it that carry sacred remains of our ancestors and carry invaluable information that we need to protect to pass on to future generations. Um, I recently had the absolute humbling privilege of working on a book about Latexen and spending months in that jungle um, trying to document and capture the stories of Latexen. And it is, the stories are so plentiful and there's no way that we are going to be able to learn from this space um, if it is cut off to us for 36 weeks of the year while these ranges are in operation. And having experienced Latexen in this way, having visited the, the Laddie sites that were just recently rediscovered there, having spent time in the caves where you will see handprints and art from our ancestors that date anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 years ago, um, having seen the families who are still fighting to get their lands back, having met the people who fish there that are descendants of original landowners um, who go there three to five times a week to get their food, having met the Surahana and Zoamti who collect omelet there, restricting this area for 36 weeks a year so some other, so uh, the military can practice for war is not acceptable to this community. Um, and knowing that in the time that we were there documenting what is there, the value of keeping these artifacts in place um, is absolutely essential. If you remove the artifact from their environment, you lose the information around them. I was really insulted when Magua was um, desecrated and the military's response was, well, this wasn't really a significant site because they only lived here maybe six months out of the year. That's very significant. That's history we want to know. We want to know these unique sites. We want to know more about these unique sites. Why did they go there only six months out of the year? What was the site used for? If there was a lot of Lusung, is it a space for healing? What kinds of healing plants are around there that your bulldozers have already destroyed? So these are things that we as a community need to determine for ourselves. We need to say what's important to us. The military cannot be telling us, oh, it's not that important, therefore it's okay to just remove everything from the space in order to do what we want to do and keep our mission moving forward. Um, so I think that that's something that is really important and I encourage you as our leaders to continue to set our values, what matters to us, and continue to fight for and protect what matters for us. Um, because again, at the end of the day, we need to fight for consent. We need to have a say. We need legal mechanisms to stop this degree of destruction. And I really hope that um, our community can be in a place soon where we're not repeating ourselves over and over and over again in these hearings, but we're actually seeing legitimate change. Um, and, and I really pray that we can continue to 
um, move forward together and that the divisive rhetoric and misinformation that is flooding the airwaves at the moment and breaking the hearts of our people stop and that people actually take a moment to try to listen to what we're trying to say and know that we're coming from a place of love. Visit Latexan. Those naysayers that are saying that these are things that belong in a museum, it's okay, visit Latexan and see for yourself exactly how powerful these spaces are and how valuable it is to us as a people and why we need to stop this firing range and protect it. Sizo Asma'asi. Today, my name is Inata Leon Guerrero Dunn. I am seven years old and I am from the village of Zonia. I'm here to talk about how the military keeps tearing down our trees and Lati and Lusong. I love going to the Texan to swim and pay our respects by putting offerings on the Lati and Lusong. And if they continue to run over and break our Lati and Lusong and, and trees, they will break the hist our history and culture. I don't want them to do this. They aren't building the firing ring for national security. They're, they are building it to practice for war, and I don't like war because there are lots of guns and bombs, and I don't like that because they kill. I want my island to be independent because the military has taken us over and is using our island to go to war and I don't want that so please call off the firing range at the Texan. Cecil Asmasi. Thank you. Um, if you would just bear with us, I know some of you have to leave. I'd like to open up for perhaps some of the senators. My colleagues have some questions for this panel of, of uh, testifiers. Senator Lee. Sisters Masi, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, everyone, for your participation in our um, hearing today on this resolution and, and for lending your voices um, in support of this resolution. One of the questions that I had is for Ms. Munoz. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think your testimony was uh, very timely. We just finished um, a special session on PFAS and some of these chemicals um, that are contained in, in some of our drinking water and we're finding out in our soil. So I just wanted to ask if you could please provide your testimony, your written testimony to the committee so we can review it. And also if you could share with us some of your sources. Uh, absolutely. I think I provided uh, about 10 physical copies and I can also forward uh, my testimony um, through email as well. Um, some of my sources were actually like the letter that I had referenced. I have the direct copy, which you can also find online. It was made public very recently. Um, and other sources also include, uh, as far as the Governor's Accountability Office report, that was dated, I believe, in September 2018, and there was also a June 2018 congressional report that DOD had also uh, made regarding the use of the aqueous film-forming foam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so one of the questions that I had for the the panel earlier today was if any of them are, are personally aware or if they're aware of any of the agencies that they represent um, that DOD re about DOD related PFOS exposure here in Guam and none of them were able to answer as succinctly and um, as, as your presentation so I really appreciate that and I think it helps to not only inform this body but our entire community of, of what's at stake so again I just really appreciate your, everybody here, I know you took a lot of time to prepare your testimony for this evening. And so again, I thank you for participating. It's extremely important that we hear all sides of this issue and we encourage people to come out and participate in this process. I'm sure that the chair will be um, receiving additional testimony for a few days after this hearing. So we encourage um, 
those who are here who, who have not uh, provided oral testimony or written testimony to please send it in. And anybody that's watching, um, you can feel free to send in testimony online uh, via email or drop it off to um, the vice speaker's office. And we really want to be able to hear from our entire community. But I thank you so much for your work and for sharing that with us today. Sijos Masi. Sijos Masi. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Taitigui. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, not so much a question, but I really appreciated Else, is that your, how you pronounce your name? Okay, and uh, I even looked up what kind of ecologist you are, and uh, the, the information from Right, that was me that requested for your testimony, it has a lot of great information here. And um, I, I just have a question. W with so much information that you have, and it's very thorough, um, especially I, I knew about that the tree being the only one uh, providing seeds, which is very important. And I think a lot of people are forgetting that, even in the media, forgetting that. That one tree is the only tree that's producing a seed. We lose that. There's no growth moving on. Have you had the opportunity actually to look at the, um, the process on if there is a discovery of something that's uh, indigenous and, and, and a threat of extinction, extinction um, on, on the process. Have you had an opportunity to look at the problematic agreement? Um, concerning the tree? Concerning anything that, that's discovered while the military is built up. Uh, there's so, a process. So about the genetic study then more specifically? Are you um, the one doing the genetic there, study? Th yes, okay. and just to clarify, there is two genetic studies going on, but I'm just speaking on mine. And I'm so sure that both of our studies that are ongoing will benefit, you know, knowing more about the tree. But so currently I'm still working on that research and I, I think I'll probably have results by the end of the year. So, but. Now we have one tree that is reproducing seeds on Guam and we have about 30 to 35 in Rhoda. So it's actually critically endangered, nevertheless if it's over one or two islands. But let's say it's in a distinct species, meaning that the ones on Guam and Rhoda are different, then it becomes even more extinct. You know, then we're dealing with the last tree of its kind on Guam, let's say it is a distinct species. But I cannot say, of course, if it, that is the case right now. There's two genetic studies that you mentioned, the one that you're doing. Who's the other one doing the other genetic It's study? at the university as well. So, But I, I don't know the methods or what exactly the object, objectives are. I just know that mine is um, you know, addressing the whole genus of Syrianthus, meaning that I'm looking at the relatedness compared to the ones in Yap and Palau, where I was able to get samples from. And then I also actually have samples from all the other islands, but that's via a herbaria. So the, the data could not all be um, preserved anymore because DNA does degrade if it gets warm and cold. So it's, it's wait and see if those samples will work. And if I'm not mistaken, the, is the UOG uh, study probably by the end of December as well? I, I have, I'm not aware when that will be published. Yeah. But if yours is going to take till December, it most likely will yes. probably be the same amount of time. Yes. So yes, but I would like to clarify that even let's say that this species is the same, right? The Rhoda and Guam one, so it seems the same status. It's still really valid to keep the last Syrianthus tree where it is right now, and it's also important to use that place to establish a healthy population of Syrianthus around it, not just protect that one tree, but the whole habitat, and also. You know, that habitat is very unique in Guam. It's called more a primary limestone forest, meaning that there's really still a, a really good uh, understory of trees and, and uh, healthy uh, canopy trees. And also the species occurring there are um, more rare than elsewhere. And the topography of the, the area is very karst. I always tell people, imagine being in a cockpit, and they call it cockpit karst, because you can fit a person in it. So the, the Mariana eight spot butterfly only um, feeds on two host plants, and those host plants also occur in that kind of habitat. So there, it's more than just a tree. It's of course, the tree is important, but the whole habitat is kind of unique in its kind. And we really need to protect that special habitat there. So I really call for a halt to this range, not just for a pause and wait what the study will say, but really 
you know, this, this is too unique to, to, to lose that kind of, and it was actually identified as a conservation area and it's still used by fruit bat. So, and we don't know what their behavior will be if there's a firing range and fragmenting a, a, a beautiful forest like that would really have a, an impact on, on not just the tree, but the whole ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, so, and it's also kind of, you know, like in the um, recovery plan for Sorientas, they also really clearly state not to clear around the tree. So, yeah. Thank you so that much. It's, it's, uh, it's good information to have, and I'm hoping everyone hears that because this is the reason why we're here today. And that being said, Madam Speaker, I, I mean, Madam Chair, um, I'm don't know, but has there been an invitation for someone from SHPO to be here? Uh, we we have gone through the public hearing notice, um, so the Shippo I believe has been replaced at the time. Right, he's a there's an acting Shippo from right. the government of Guam, and and I was just wondering if an invitation was sent uh, to him to come here. The whole island was invited to attend. Okay, Senator, nothing personal. Okay, <laughs> well I was hoping they would be here too as well. Uh, the process and the thank you so much. Uh, I remember. Uh, all of you during 2008 on this military buildup when I was in the 30th Guam legislature and still hear your concerns and it just goes to show you what's happened for 10 years and what's going on today. So I wish our voices were heard back then. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Shelton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions at this time, but I just wanted to thank the panel for being here today, for sharing all that you have, and especially to Mr. Dunn. I was very impressed by your testimony, and I think today uh, what you shared reminded all of us how important the voices of our youth are, so I wanted to say thank you to you, and especially to the other young people who are here in the audience today to share their concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kelly marsh Titano. Afide and Sidhu uh, Masi to everybody for being here. As has been mentioned, I know this has been a long road. Many of you, if not all of you, have been working on this and fighting for this for many years. I want to point out, um, I'm so thankful for all of the testimony thus far. Each of you is contributing something particular and, and different from one another. And I think it's so important to note that so much of what you're saying, it's coming from a very informed place. I think people have a tendency to think about these sort of causes as, you know, just coming from the community maybe in general, but the diversity of the groups that are here, from original landowners to the youth, to university professors, to scientists, uh, to those that are in the business industry and elsewhere, you know, in publishing and, and so forth. I think the community really needs to pay attention and realize that it is this wide variety, this wide swath of our community that are stepping forward and coming from very informed places, be it from uh, traditional knowledge, just love and passion from their hearts, or from academic knowledge or more. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned, Elsa, that the tree has the best chance, and not only just the tree, but uh, the seedlings and the saplings, that have been mischaracterized as trees out there. There are not 18 trees. There's one tree, and then there are some seedlings and saplings. Um, but they have the best chance there. And, and when you said that, it really occurred to me. We've heard about these trees that used to be here degrading in Tarzan Falls and some of the other areas. But that one tree, even though it is struggling with its health, it has survived typhoons, it survived time, it survived so much, and it's still there, and it's still producing seeds on a continual basis. So I really think that speaks to the importance of that 
ecosystem that's there, it's not surviving well anywhere else that, that I know of, uh, and certainly I'm not the expert here. But I, I also wanted to provide you an opportunity to speak to a couple of things. Um, my understanding is that trees in Luta, that even though the population number has been pointed to many times as having 40 trees there or that there have been numerous uh, seedlings that have been planted there through some programs, uh, my understanding is, is that the adults are struggling, um, they're dying over there, and maybe there's not even an understanding of why. Could you speak about uh, the overall health uh, in both Luta and here? Sure. So, yeah, I've been talking with people from Luta, and they also say they're struggling, but they also notice the same thing as I'm noticing, that a certain area, actually, the area facing Guam and Luta, that's where they're actually occurring, which is kind of beautiful in a way. That's the place where they actually do well. And we've been thinking about maybe we should collect some soil and see what the mycorrhizae are in there. Maybe there's something to it, to these places, why it's still thriving over there. So, and about the seedlings for sure, and saplings, you know, like just technical terms, they call a seedling between zero and one inch in, in circumference, and then uh, three inch to five is sapling and above is a tree. So it will take at least five to 10 years, if not more, to reproduce seeds. And given the fact that here in Guam, there's a lot of insect pests, I, there's a whole list of them that attack them. They take a lot of care. So it's not even a, a given that they will survive. And I was actually part of the outplantings that happened at the Guam Wildlife Refuge. And a few are actually doing quite all right. But that, that will still take a long time for them to give seeds. So it's really crucial that we keep that, that mother tree alive and certainly not clear around it. And in Rhoda, I just visited Rhoda last week actually, and the, they have a beautiful tree out planted on the side of the road with a plaque on there with its name, and it actually has no more leaves, it's dying. So I don't know what happened to it. I, haven't, I hadn't had the chance to ask about that particular tree. So for sure, I think nine years ago, they still had 150 trees or something, and now they're down to 35. Um, but for the spacing of the tree, for sure, I think we're banking, for now, that the 30 feet for sure is not enough to allow the tree to spread its seedlings further away from it than it is right now. And I think that should for sure be addressed. So I would really recommend to keep that forest for Sorientas and for other species that occur there, um, yeah, as it is. Yeah, so that is something uh, that strikes me as beautiful and powerful that somehow those two mm -hmm. places that are facing each other and right across from each other, that those are the two places where they're really succeeding. Right. <laughs> um, and the percentages of loss are sobering. They're incredibly sobering, and I, I think it really justifies not taking a chance anywhere with anything related to that tree. I believe there were 70 or 73 seedlings that were planted. Only 18 are surviving now. We can't guarantee how, our, how many are making it beyond now. Um, from 150 down to 35, I mean, those are massive losses, 75% or more, I think. But I also wanted to provide you an opportunity to uh, inform us a bit about the genetic study. Is it a typical study? Is it the same type of study they've been doing year after year? And so, you know, maybe there's uh, nothing new about the way you're studying it. Could you speak to the type of genetic study that you're doing? So, yeah. So my study is using kind of latest um, techniques, you know, to, to, to address. I actually cannot, like, really explain that in detail, it's kind of complex, but I mean, um, the people I work with is with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is, my advisors are there too, so um, I'm pretty confident that it will be a valid answer when we have the results, so, um, but to the one, to the, to the survival rate of this, of the um, seedlings, I want to point out that Usually with rare and endangered species, survivability of, of trees is often small. So you have to actually make sure you gather enough seeds and try, 
you know, have enough efforts to, and uh, you know, the Guam Plant Extinction Prevention Program is doing this right now and doing a good job in trying to at least not just focus on, they focus on different areas and that's what also is recommended in the um, recovery plan to actually have four populations of 500 trees. Imagine how much place, space you need for that. So if you would take the area at, uh, at Tailalo right now, you need a lot of space to be able to establish that healthy population. Um, so, yeah. But for the, for the um, phylogenetic study, that's the way how, how you can distinguish um, species for sure and is the valid way to do it, so. Situ Spasi for providing more detail there. And as you were speaking, it also reminded me, I heard that, I think it was last week that they suffered a fire over there and many trees, Mary Sarian, this Nelsonii trees were, or Tonkanguafi or yes. Hudson Lagu, trees were burnt. And we have a lot of fires up here. We have typhoons, we have super typhoons. We're mm -hmm. back into El Nino. So, you know, just again and again and again, just emphasizing that we can't take any chances with these, mm -hmm. these trees, but especially in that space where it has survived. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, for the genetic study, it's the, you know, um, no, sorry, for, for the, the survival rate of these species, you know, you cannot really predict what it, what it will be, but the, the thing we can do is just protect the mother tree as long as we can, and I think that's the most important. Yeah. So, Sujuis Masi, everybody here, and uh, Sujuis Masi, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Marsh Tysnow. Senator Ferris? I just want to thank everybody coming out here today. Um, I know we've been doing this for so long, and I think it's important. This, this resolution is very important, and, and you being here today to, to basically emphasize that we do not give our consent. And it's important that we are on the record. But I think also, after hearing you, everyone speak here today, I'm thinking, what next? What is our next move as a community? You know, I think it's, you know, it's important that we, we um, keep our words here, you know, that it's, it's, it's a documented here um, as far as our resistance to this firing range. But what is our next moves to make sure that we can protect this area? So that's something I, I would like to talk further afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Chalahi. Thanks, I just want to thank you all. And I know that there are a lot of you waiting to testify, so I don't want to take very long, but I want to make sure that we're just accurate in describing your process. So, and I want to acknowledge that we did receive testimony from the Admiral and on dated July 3rd, 2019, Department of the Navy. And, um, and part of this, uh, she describes the process that I know we were talking about earlier when I showed the slides as to the firing ranges, which ones were being cleared, that type of thing. Um, so she says that the Navy, the, sorry, the Navy confirms nine discoveries of potential historic value have been made during the vegetation clearing and site preparation activities of the main cantonment and the LFTRC. For every discovery of this nature per the NHPA section six, I mean section 106 PA process, and in consultation with the SHPO, the contractor guided by an archeologist establishes a high visibility fence around the area, including a 30 meter, approximately 98 feet buffer around each site. Further construction that may affect the potential historic property is suspended until an archeological investigation is completed. One site completed data recovery, and the others are still in the contracting for archeological assessment stage. Overall, project construction continues away from new discoveries in accordance with the agreed historic preservation process. The process includes first evaluating the option for preserving in place, and if not feasible, then determining if direct and indirect effects can be mitigated or if data recovery of the historic property for safe curation, research, and public display opportunities is the best preservation of the information and the artifacts. The outcome of this, when they um, of this process resulted in over 76 archaeological and historical sites being preserved in place and only 14 were determined to require data recovery 
for safe curation, research, and public information and display opportunities. Also, findings prior to final design of a range road in Northwest Field resulted in four archaeological sites being preserved in place by relocating the road. These decisions are not made unilaterally, rather they are made after consultations with subject matter experts from federal and Guam agencies. And I just wanted to highlight a couple things here so that we're all on the same page because I, I've heard this language over and over and in the media, I feel like it's really misconstrued. And so yes, the Admiral's correct, but also many of the other people who've testified are absolutely correct that Yes, so they had a process, they looked at the area, and they determined this many cultural sites, this many cultural sites from uh, surveys, past research that might have been done, I mean, uh, kind of general research on the property. Sometimes they do visual surveys, but they don't clear the area when they make these determinations. So in that early stage, they found that many sites. This is on this one area, and they've divided these sites, you know, into this many pieces. And um, then when they are clearing the area now, which is what we showed on the slides, when they are clearing, now they're in the stage of well, many of these discoveries were made when they were actually pulling trees out of the ground. So they're in those phases. But, and so when they find it and they want to bring it to the attention to the shippo, they make the barrier around it, like she described. And, but she also described clearing continues in all other areas. And this is why, for me, the pause on the firing range is very important because while we're paying attention to one site, you know, I, I, I really um, qu question the, you know, continuing the clearing because we are talking about one site or now three, I thought three, but it's nine new discoveries on top of the 14 that have already been cleared and um, in an area where there are over, you know, there are a hundred sites on a piece of land that is a cliff connected to Litegzen, which many, many of you either are familiar with or we, you need to be familiar, you need to educate yourself if you're not because that is all the archaeologists describe it as one of the most important sites on Guam. It shows village over the years, and um, so how they've lived there over different time periods, 3,000 years back at least. And, and I agree that, that we don't know enough. We don't know enough. They have, you know, I think, theories of how these areas are connected to each other. And, and one of the archaeologists told me personally that in Taragi, it's very clearly connected, right? He, his theory was there's a, you know, we have the village, we have pathways going to the cliff, we have pathways up the cliff, you know, to that, the land on top of it. And uh, so in my mind, it's like that didn't, that's expanded knowledge that we don't learn when we can't connect these areas to the villages and see how, how they had to survive when food sources changed, time periods changed, uh, maybe periodically for different reasons. I, I really don't know. I'm not an archaeologist, but I do, I do appreciate that there's a lot of knowledge that, that can be obtained from these areas. The problem with the programmatic agreement is that, yes, we are consulted, or the SHPO is consulted, but there is really no power in that agreement to halt or to, to change a designation by the military that it cannot be avoided. And so that's, that's really the bottom line that uh, for me, yeah, why, why the testimony is very important because that's what we're looking at. Yes, we can comply with that programmatic agreement. We can consult, consult, consult and we can tell them we really would like you to avoid this area, but the bottom line is we don't have any authority by that agreement to, to avoid the area. Only they do, only by their discretion. And, and so that's why I think it's very important, and I want to thank all of you for being here to show if these areas are important, because they're making it seem like they're, they're I mean, you know, that some of them are, some of them are not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Chalahi. I'd like to thank all of you from the panel for, for your testimony and for answering some of our questions. And 
Thank you, Nan, for having the courage to come up here. I think uh, it's important that we preserve our our current uh, habitat for for your future generations. So thank you for coming. Okay, okay we'll call on to the next panel. We left off. We left off with Suzuki Boy, uh, I'm sorry, it's Roy, Leah Balansai, is that Ronald? Ro yeah. Ronald Balansai, uh, Rosalia Mamachai Mateo, Zita Pangalinen. If you'd like to give testimony, please move, come forward. Deborah Ellen, Catherine McCollum, Lavelle Castro, Baltazan, Baltazar Uggen, Lou Bejado, Starlet Cruz, former Senator Hope Cristobal, Cameron Kitigua, Edward Leon Guerrero, okay. Manica Flores. And Desiree Ventura. Can we, we will start with you, and then we'll work your way down left. All right. Buenas uh, tardes, Toru Hamzu. In all news, Kenneth Goffigan Cooper, Professor Zugi, political science, Guinea Betsa da Guahan. Gagu Zuguini Pogo, but by support the resolution, Peru Gaga, Imagahagan Guahan, Peru Napara Nyahu, and Peru Napara Hat, Imazamaknya, you trust us tomorrow, Guinea Nimahatsanya, you look at Sia Militat. Uh, good evening, Senators. I'm here to show my support for this resolution calling for a pause to clearing and construction activities and would like to thank the 13 of you who are introducing the resolution as well as challenge the absent remaining two of you to give your support. Uh, while many who have testified or will testify here will have detailed biological and conservation-minded arguments that speak directly to the overwhelming intricacies of the live fire training ridge complex, I hope to complement these arguments through unmasking a larger historical process at play with the military buildup in general, and that is something of slow violence. Senators, I invite you to imagine two scenarios that Professor Rob Nixon describes. He asks, what is more violent, the bombing of a country in Africa or using that country as a dump site for toxic waste? For most, the former would clearly be the winner of this thought experiment as it fits the stereotypical conditions of violence. When we think of violence, we tend to think of it as immediate in time, explosive, spectacular, and extremely visible. Using a country as a dump site, however, does not fit all of these characteristics, and thus for many may not even be seen as an act of violence. Uh, yet most of the violence that happens in places like Wuhan used as military, as military bases takes this form of slow violence, a slow contamination of the soil and water, a slow and steady forced economic dependence, a slow process of putting military interests first, 
and in our case, even a drawn out and steady period of sovereignty denial. All of these things should constitute as violence for those of us who live here as they all greatly affect our home and our futures. What I am asking all of you, our public leaders, is to come closer to the realization that the military buildup, despite being touted as the provider of our security, is actually a process of slow and incremental violence. The destruction of artifacts, the removal of limestone forests, the disturbance of species, the increased forced economic dependence, and the reinforcement of our lack of sovereignty all constitute this violent process. We tend to think of violent acts as large events, but what this buildup really represents is a series of acts resulting in destruction and violation. We can even see the way that this process has structured the parameters of the debate surrounding the military buildup and associated acts such as the live fire training rich complex. For example, they went from Pagan to Letexen, and the military has tried to reason with us that they have listened to our concerns. We have reached the level and point of the military metaphorically telling us how good they are for occupying the guest bedroom of our house rather than the master bedroom. We have reached the level of debating if it is better for the robber to steal $20 or $50 from us. And then if we question the presumptions of the argument, if we begin to wonder why the military should take any more rooms in our house, if we begin to ask why we should allow the robber to take from us, we are oddly called uncompromising. We are called unrealistic. We are called overly sensitive. We get criticized for not being good community partners or for not being in line with a one Guam approach. Once again, these criticisms show just how much the militarization of this island is normalized and taken as a matter of fact. We need to be able to challenge this normalization and recognize slow violence when we see it. And resolutions like these are steps along the way. And I greatly appreciate the good work of you senators concerned with this issue. So the question with slow violence becomes, how do we respond to a violence with seemingly delayed cumulative effects? How do we respond to a violence that takes time and becomes normalized? The answer is to realize that a slow pace of destruction does not make something less destructive and that we need to have a sharper lens for catching these acts of slow violence moving forward. We need to treat these slower acts with the urgency of a crisis. One of my favorite words in Fino Tsomoru is nat lotla, which can be translated to to give life or to revitalize. Senators, I ask that you invoke this as a guiding principle of policy and lawmaking. I ask that when faced with something, you as senators ask yourselves if this particular issue or proposal will truly give life or help revitalize the island, not just as a temporary band-aid, as some may argue regarding the economics of the buildup, but as a true healing of a wound. We must stop living in a permanent state of mitigation. As we know, when it comes to the military, there is always something else lurking in the water waiting to be unveiled. And we need some guiding principles for what to do when new fins enter our line of sight. I urge you to continue being critical and to continue being matakna in your interactions with oppressive institutions and proposals. But most of all, I thank you for this resolution as this is most definitely a Guahan security issue. Sizus Masi. Thank you, Ken. Half a day. I am Cameron Kitsigwap. I am Chamorro, the granddaughter of Chamorro who thrived before the war, Chamorro who survived the war. I am the daughter of Chamorro who served in the United States Navy. I am a mother. I am a social worker. I write this testimony in support of resolution number 164-35. And I thank you all for supporting and drafting this uh, resolution. This month, we are reminded of the atrocities of war and the pain our people has endured over 75 years ago. I am here pleading to cease the construction for a live fire range needed to simulate war. For the price of national security, our people have paid with their lives. Micronesians continue to have the highest enlistment rate per capita 
All while our military veterans wait in vain for adequate amenities and care to address the traumas they have experienced during their service. These traumas they continue to live with today. Our people have paid with their land. Anderson Air Force Base sits atop our island's largest aquifer. Hazardous substances, such as operational solvents, contaminate drinking water for at least 50% of the area residents, with about 40,200 people drawing drinking water from wells located within a four-mile radius of the base. With the addition of a live fire range, bullets will rain onto our land and into our waters. This project will not bring us a sustainable future. Our children will be plagued with more cancers, more psychosocial issues, more, more war, more death. Micronesia continues to suffer at the hands of US militarism for the betterment of mankind. There's been no compensation for war survivors. There has been no adequate cleanup of toxins. No matter how many beach cleanups military personnel host, this will not erase the presence of toxins in our soil seeping into our water lens. After live fire training is conducted, they will not go into the ocean to retrieve the thousands of bullets expected to be used. Waving around the American flag and pledging allegiance to it does not bring justice for our people. It is clear that America does not care about our heritage. America does not care about our culture. America does not care about the health of our land and our people. Just as easily as they have pushed aside ancient Lati and Lusung with bulldozers, they will continue to push us aside from the land by which we have every right. The livelihood of our futures will crumble with the rest of our history. 75 years ago, our people faced life to rebuild from a war that was not theirs, their lands stolen. With strength, they lived on. What we fail to acknowledge is that these pains still follow us today. Even though I did not experience immediate post-war Guam, I still live it. We heard the stories from our grandparents and we have seen them mourn. These pains live with us today just as the Agent Orange dumped in our land continues to poison our wombs and our nannies. We can no longer afford to pay the price with our lives so that America may ensure their national security. We are the ones at risk. We have been the target of North Korea's nuclear bomb. We are the ones dying from cancers. We are the ones struggling to feed and house ourselves. Thousands of native people cannot afford to live in adequate housing, all while military personnel sleep comfortably with that 2,000 monthly housing allowance. We are the ones struggling to heal ourselves from this continuing oppression. We can no longer play the role of being hospitable people to Rear Admiral Chatfield when we are being trampled upon. I implore you to continue adv advocating for your people, the ones who placed you in those seats. I encourage you to continue standing for your island because we are losing more and more of our identity while the Department of Defense continues to build their empire on top of our ancestors' remains. Our land is more valuable than just a strategic location to house military bases. We deserve clean water. Our children deserve clean water. We deserve fertile land and we deserve peace. We will not have another 75 years to wait for a liberation because our true liberation needs to happen now. The fate of our land depends on it. Sisos Masi. Offaday Senators, uh, I want to first thank you for your brave stance uh, despite all of the politics that is going on in this very important time. Um, I think your bravery is very admirable and you speak beautifully for our people. I am in full support of Resolution 16435. While our island continues to have differing views on the importance of preserving sacred sites, and some believe the ec that economic benefits from the military buildup trumps our human responsibility to ensure we protect our island's ecosystem, I pray that we agree on one thing, that we must safeguard at all costs the major source of our island's life-sustaining water. By allowing the waste of nearly seven million pounds 
of explosives and munitions generated yearly from the live firing range to sit above our northern aquifer, we turn a blind eye to the well-being of our people and perhaps our continued existence. As an institution, the military is a well-oiled machine and will do what, it, what is necessary to complete its mission. Put for bought, please do not let this machine do as it pleases anymore. Do not forsake our lives. Do not for forsake our future generations. And if uh, this is being televised, I'm calling to all of the people in my generation who was under the United States and who was pretty much brainwashed to believe that the United States is the way to go, I'm calling for all of you to come out and stand up and fight for our island and fight for our people. Fight for our water so that we can continue to be Chamorros in our own land. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a very, very rough um, time in a very, very critical time. And what I would like to say is just put for board. We need to have our voice unified. We need to have a message that's strong enough for everybody on the island and everybody in the world to understand where we're coming from. And um, Senator Sabina, I, I think you asked what's next. After 10 years of all of this, what is next? I really think that at this point in time, we need to safeguard our island's aquifer. This is a way in. Um, Lola uh, talked about how we need consent when they're from the military when um, our resources are being threatened. So I hope that maybe we can look into this and find a way to move forward uh, with this um, idea. But again, thank you so much. Uh, your bravery, I think, is a true testament to the, to the power of our Magahaga. And our Magahaga, we rule, <laughs> you know. The Chamorro women have it throughout time fought in their own ways and continue to fight. And I want you to know that we will all stand behind you. Sidzulis Ma'asi, Saina Ma'asi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uggen. Can you please just state your name for the record so that when we do our report, yes. we know who you are? My name is Balthazar Berdalio Uggen, a resident of Mangila. Havidei, Senators. My name is Catherine Flores McCullum, Familian Apu. I am one of about five um, families that are, have claimed to Retidian. And I know that um, I, I was telling my cousin, man, I'm just tired of being here. I've been here since 1994, fighting for our family's land to be returned. Our land, Retidian, was condemned in 1962. It was the last condemnation that took place here in Guam, and it was the first released property. Well, we didn't get it back. My parents, my grandparents, went to court to fight for their land because they didn't want to give it up. And then during that time, if you read back in the history, they were supposed to return all property that was not in use or that, that the military didn't need. What did they want Retidian for at the time? It started out with two officers uh, swimming in our beach. And Mr. Castro pointed a gun at them says, get out of our property. And he's called the meanest a landowner down at Letecton. But I've been sitting here since 1994, back and forth, back and forth, resolution after resolution. I can name 
a lot of the resolutions that uh, pertain to Retidian. And now it's come to a point where it's an environmental issue. And at the time we were fighting for our land back, there wasn't a single bird that you could hear chirping in the, in the wind when we would overnight. And I would ask, I even have a song that I, I made for that. And yet now we have so many <laughs> endangered species that that is being introduced into this legislation. And I'm sorry if I'm being a little bit taken, I'm taking everybody aback here. But I was against the environmental issue during those days. I was not in Nashant's Moro yet. I was just a Retidian landowner uh, association. We have gone through all the lawyers you can think of. We have put in so much money and even put our, our properties up for, for uh, you know, for sale, just to, just to um, help us fight this issue. And I'm still here, and Retidian's not. We have people that have, don't even, are not even a part of this um, fight. They, they weren't even a part of the condemnation, and they're right next door to us, and yet they took everything. And I'm, I keep telling them, fight for your land. Man, if this was mine, I'd be right here setting up shot right here. I have memories of my grandfather telling me, don't bother the turtle laying there. But what, I'm just going to be living with memories. Yet my grandparents fell in love. They stayed down there and built their family. And you know what I was listening to about love? Our people do love. My grandmother, when she died in 1992, and we had to dig up her two sons. And if you talk about this to the older folks, they'll remember Frank and Tommy, who were killed in a refrigerator. They were playing hide and go seek. And I've never met them in my life because they died way before I was ever born. But when they dug their bodies up at Pico to be buried with my grandmother. I was crying so hard. I said, I don't even know these two. And yet my heart was just burning every time the shovel went down and dug and dug and dug. Oh, we found a bow, a finger. I think this is a finger. I said, why am I here? Why am I crying? I don't even know these two. And yet this whole time, Nana was to be buried. She was our lifeline from Tidian. And it was a part of us that left. And then when they told, then Angel, Angel Santos told that Retidian was being released but I need for you guys to come down. And we were so excited. Oh my God. We promised my grandmother that if we got Retidium back, we'd build a shrine for, for God. We'd build a beautiful shrine and we'll pay homage for coming home. But it wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Angel, I mean, I, that damn it, we were told to come down there. And we were told the land is not ours. It belongs to Fish and Wildlife. So what the? I don't, I don't want to cuss. Because believe me, I could cuss. Your land's not coming back. So why did you call us here? And I had just, 
spent three years with my husband who was in the Navy to come home to find out the federal government took our land, took our land for condemnation, took our land again. So I promised that I would, as long as that door is open, I'm there. But it has made me sick. It has made me sick. To, and to find out that Richidian is one of the highest con contaminated properties on this island. I went to, to these BRAC, um, uh, these uh, brat, what's the name of that? 94, 96, to tell me they were going to spend $10,000 to clean up the contamination. I'm sorry. It really takes me a long time to recover from all this. I just want you to know that I have watched your fathers, some of your fathers, pleaded with them to help us. And they thought that maybe sitting on that chair was gonna help get our lands back. Helping with fundraisers and so many fr friends and families gathered together to, to uh, try and help us get some money to our lawyers. And we had a good case, too. But we were riding on the landowners that actually are called private property owners. And they settled for behind the fence again. I am very angry with the way things have gone. I have asked myself, what's the use? I am one of those that would just get on my car and drive down to Retidian and block the whole place, which I've done over and over. And then they call me the Magahaga and I've shown some more because I did that. But I'm the worst Magahaga because I don't even speak my language. That they took away from me a long time ago. And uh, my family is behind me. I don't know if they like what I say up here, but uh, we're still here because we're hoping for us to go home. And uh, I know many of us have had their land return, and it's because of the struggles of many of us, hope included next to me. All the senators and the governor that sat and rallied for our lands to be returned. Military should pay for everything that they're living in. They should pay all our taxes. But they, I'm telling you, I have a premonition coming up. And it's not a firing range they're going to use that part for. It's going to be a landing strip. They're going to remove their landing strip from Anderson. And I hope I'm wrong. But if it's not a firing range that we're going to be fighting for, it's going to be another airstrip that they're going to put down there. Ask me why? Historically, they used that property to bomb Hiroshima. That was a landing strip. So, many of the testimonies are going to lead to that. Not, not exactly to the airstrip, but that's something that just dawned on me today. But if it's not a firing range, and senators, I think you need to go and back to uh, the, the admiral and find out how many, how many true firing range that they have on this island. How big is it? And why isn't it 
being used for this, you know, why do they have to build another one? When my husband heard that there was going to be a firing range open up near Ritidian, he said, another one? We have five. I said, I don't know. That's what they want to do. One more firing range. Yep, five. Thank you, Senators. I don't know what more I can say here. Buenas and half a day. I have honorably Quintusadora Tina Munya Barnes. And she told me that she has gone to a community meeting up north. Uh, regarding the FSM issues with uh, the governor and some other uh, government uh, essential people. Um, but anyway, she excused herself to many of us. Uh, Bisa Quintusadora, Telina Cruz Nelson, Sinadora Therese M. Terlahi, Sabina Flores Perez, Telo Taitagui, Kelly Mars Taitano, Amanda Shelton, and Regine Bisco, I guess Regine took off. Na anhu si Hope Cristobo, tamorozo, mafanyagun guahanzo, tanto tanozo, sumasagazo zani familia kugiza tamuni. Si dus ma si no esti na oportunidade para bay fan in sima put asunto ni ginago supporti gimaga haga lut dis aflagui leon guerrero ifinene na na ma haga guam guahan. This the mask it says in two años. Tati. Ni para usangani, i federadi departamento ni nebi, na una para i ma distrosa ni izatai lalu. I planuniha ni live fire training range complex. I ginago, puede sinya o ma protehi i lugar, i ma nao tauta, i tauta o isan lago gi islata guahan, kun todo adzo siha. I tau tau le tek zan, i halum tanu zan todi rin shatta gui hina lugat. For the record, my name is Hope Alvarez Cristobo. I hail with my mangafa, the alabado, the taimanglu, the achaigua, the matanani, and the fegutgut, and my matrilineal ancestral predecessors of Oceania. I live in Tamuning, and I am here because I fully support Legislative Resolution 164-35, COR, that calls on Armagahaga to act on preventing the destruction of an important Chamorro historic property, many properties there, as, as we now find out from Senator Terlahi, that should have been reported and registered as Guam historic properties by the military. That's the un my understanding of a process of protection. Anyone who knows a little about Guam history will tell you that all coastal areas of Guam are replete with Chamorro, burials, cultural artifacts, and I question the accuracy of so-called discoveries as confirmed by the terminated Shippo Linda Ogden that they will find more. The rate of destruction of evidences of Chamorro existence, identity, and history of a non-self-governing or colonial people, a people who once enjoyed sovereignty in this land, and critically important, a people who have yet to write our history that will distinguish us as the indigenous people of Guam who deserve special protection under both the U.S. Constitution and the United Nations Charter, including successive resolutions that affirm our status as a non-self-governing people. What is happening at Tailalu and the surrounding areas is not only discriminatory and disrespectful, but it is anti-Chamoru history, an anti-Chamoru culture and identity. 
My dear senators, the Chamorro people face unparalleled pressures as people in a U.S. colonial territory by the U.S.'s very own military forces in this 21st century. We cannot disregard the sad state of affairs of the loss of lands, of our lands, for war preparations by the military. The outrageous contaminations of our drinking water, the continued destruction of our homeland's landscape and coastlines to add to the ramification of a subject people that are clearly suffering the consequences of militarization, colonization. I am 72 years old, going on 73 this year. I have spent half of my lifetime working to protect and preserve our ancestral burial sites and Chamorro cultural heritage sites. My experiences regarding the preservation of these sites have basically been the result of government failure to inform and invite public comment on the impacts to burial sites or an important historic property. My experiences relating to destruction of Chamorro historic properties relegated as collateral damage in the building of hotels at Matapang Beach, at Goknya, where the Nico Hotel now sits, at the former Fajita Hotel, at Tumon proper, where the Hyatt Regency Hotel now sits, with over 500 desecrations there, and the destruction of a major historical building that represents the development, the political development of a new government of Guam, consented to by the Historic Resources Division. That has been quite demoralizing. The historic Rosario House, built in the 1800s in Agatna, for example, was slated for demolition. This precious house that survived the raising of Agatna by the United States Marines post-World War II would have been raised at the hands of our very own government of Guam, have it not for a complaint filed with the Historic Resources Division at Department of Parks and Rec. The complaint procedurally placed the Rosario House on board agenda for discussion and public comment. I was able to study and visit the structure and presented my opposition to its destruction and recommend its preservation due to its historical significance. It is in this way that I and others who were able to provide definite information about the structure participate and were able to help in preserving it in the work of historic preservation. The process worked and today this building should be slated for restoration by our local government. The public learned about potential desecrations and destruction of historic resources throughout, Gu throughout Guam through the publicly announced monthly agenda of the Historic Preservation Review Board. This is how it was. It was through this process that people like myself participated in articulating the purposes and procedures for preservation. Yet another historic property issue was the proposal to mail out over 300 of our Chamorro human remains of our ancestors that was excavated at Goknya. They were to be mailed in mailboxes to be sent off island for study. The, historical, the Historic Review Board placed this issue in its meeting agenda, basically publicly alerting the people that the board with members of technical knowledge in the fields of architecture, history, planning, archaeology, and education was able to discuss and vote to deny the request to mail our ancestors' remains after comments were allowed to be heard. This review process existed, existed for public comment and input on impacts to important historic properties. And if our concerns seemed to be ignored, it was important to get the word out by informing and exposing any anomalies that prevent real preservation and respect of our sacred burial grounds. If it appears that there may be collusion, we went to court 
and got an injunction to prevent the project from destroying the burial grounds of our ancestors. It is this kind of commitment to the preservation of our heritage that I and other preservationists espouse to even today to ensure that the evidence of our Chamorro identity is respected and not destroyed. Over the years, the effect of the government of Guam's mitigation preservation approach has been detrimental and perhaps contributed to the mentality that pervades the powers that be at the time of the plans to relocate over 5,000 Marines to Guam and faced with creating fast growth through this so-called development and construction, the construction of live fire training range was to be guided by a programmatic agreement now, an agreement that does not take into consideration an equal playing field and the fact of Guam's lack of real power to negotiate. Furthermore, this programmatic agreement undermines community comment and review of important historic resources. The U.S. military has often stated at its public outreach for many of their DEIS, their SEIS, and the e there's so many EISs, I'm, we, I get confused, required of the NEPA process that Guam's non-self-governing territory status is not, is not a consideration when discussing the vast and unmitigable changes to our land, to our people, and our resources. If we can't leverage this situation, then there might as well be no programmatic agreement. As a preservationist and an activist, I am deeply, deeply concerned with the desecration of sacred burial grounds, the elimination of Chamorro historic properties, and evidences of our history, the erasing of Chamorro place names, and the eradication of our culture and identity as the indigenous people of Guam. As elected leaders of Guam, you all should be just as concerned. The U.S. military's colonial practices must be abated. Chamorro historic properties hold meaning for our people. It is through these meanings and connections that we construct the legitimacy to create and build our community in Guam. We must cherish and preserve them for the memories and history that lift us up and for the edification of our Chamorro people. The Chamorro people await a caring attitude and government policy that protects and embodies historic preservation in Guam to the highest level, whether it is by the U.S. military or by the government of Guam. The Chamorro people await the yet-to-be-written historic narrative that will not be empty of substance associated with their cultural heritage found and respectfully preserve where our ancestors lived, roamed, and thrived. The level of historic preservation should not be different inside military-controlled lands as it is outside. The process of public review and scrutiny must be restored to allow for public comment as well as the nomination of sites to the Guam and the National Register of Historic Places. Guam needs a strong, proactive historic preservation law that respects Guam's history as a non-self-governing territory yet to be decolonized and one that respects our community values of respeto para imatay and protects our interests as a colonial people. We must create our own framework rooted with decolonial historic preservation above and beyond U.S. standards. We must be willing to commit to a more creative imagination of what we can do together to restore our political dignity and reclaim our Chamorro lands. I respectfully ask you, dear senators, to do the right thing with a sense of resolve and resilience to honor our Chamorro people by passing this resolution 164-35-COR. 
and by making a statement to protect our people and our cultural heritage. I applaud your courage and bravery in these times because we all need your inspiration for ourselves. This begins our stand for a decolonized history for a better future for our people. Sidus Masi. Half a day to all honorable senators before us today. This testimony is presented on behalf of the National Association of Social Workers, Guam Chapter. I am Lovell Castro, president of the board. NASW thanks you for this opportunity to present testimony in absolute support of Resolution 164-35. In 2009, the National Associations of Social Workers, Guam Chapter, submitted a 40-page testimony to the Department of Defense in response to the release of the draft environmental impact statement, standing in opposition to the Guam military buildup. Our testimony largely contained concerns related to the functioning of the island's social service programs and the impact of an increased military presence on our fragile local social service system. The Department of Defense stated that our community collectively submitted approximately 10,000 testimonies, which was reported unprecedented in the US DOD history. Also unprecedented was the nearly 11,000 page document that we were expected to review. Our island's collective response addressed concerns related to the impact of the military buildup on our island's frail infrastructure to include utilities, water, and wastewater system, negative impacts on our environment, cultural properties, increased traffic, strain on our local hospital, and so forth. Much to our disappointment, the release of the final environmental impact statement reinforced what we know that the Department of Defense will do as it wishes and without our consent, which is consistent with our current colonial unincorporated territorial status. We were disappointed because in spite of our massive community operating, the DOD only changed two things from the DEIS to the FEIS. First was the development of a plan to address Guam's wastewater system because the US EPA flagged this as a concern and second, it slowed down its aggressive timeline of the buildup because the island's infrastructure could not handle the rapid rate of development that was proposed in the DEIS. None of our concerns about the negative impacts on the environment, our fragile social service system, and our cultural resources and practices were addressed. Clearly, our current political status has undermined our right as people to influence and effectuate plans in our community. And we've heard this before. We must remind ourselves that our current relationship with the United States is not based on love or respect. The following are references and quotes about our island made by DOD personnel that clearly illustrates this point, that Guam is the tip of the the spear of US military, America's unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Pacific, our outpost in the Pacific, fortress Pacific, power projection hub. According to Captain Robert Lee, we're seeing a realignment of forces away from Cold War theaters to Pacific theaters, and Guam is ideal for us because it is a US territory and therefore gives us maximum flexibility. Guam is no longer the trailer park of the Pacific, Guam has emerged from backwater status to the center of the radar screen. This is rapidly becoming the focus for logistics, for strategic planning. Clearly, we are a pawn used in the geopolitical chess game of the United States. In closing, we urge all matters of this esteemed body, Ilehaslatura and Guahan, to support Resolution 164-35, which will serve as a record that we, as a community, did indeed stand up for our rights. Sijos Masi. Buenos Vice Speaker Nelson, Senator um, Shelton, Teresa Lahi, Sabina Paris, and 
Kelly Marsh Taitano. Um, in a anhu sizita pangalin and president in Faza Foundation, Zahure persesenta i manzo amti zani board Haza Foundation. Esta kinsi anus distikin to tuhun Haza Foundation para in pertehi zantanat lotla zantanat famta i tiningu put amut zani amut para i hinem lotta. Gaigizu pagu para bai usu in supporti i legislative resolution number 164-35 para u faisi magahaga luliangro pa una para i ma distro sanitano para i militar ki the north with westfield or tyla lu fion liktaitsan lo put fa boat fa nui militar na tadza diritsu niha gitanota fa nui todo put fa boat na tita sedi estina distro su za tadza guini kumense kumense edzuna in ilihi hamzu Na in agadza in agadesi ibidan mimizu. Ginin todu ima fatna gueta, ima ginin ima nainata, ni mas di transmit kinentus anus, zani man zo amti pagu, zangin ta respeta itano itasi i airi, sinya ta anungoku na malik i saluta. Talili i esta ima gaim kitautauta man malalangu. Man 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 matai, man hobin i man hobin, bula kancit diabetes zan estisia i man mapupuno si maisa siha. Hager sa i man zo amti masangan na sinya ta amtin maisa hit. Esti i tanu anay masoda megay lusung masosoda gilugat, pues masangan na zangin megay lusung, Tenikia like loki sagan iman zo amti, zan loki naturat na bula amut. Man susus tuham esta iman man man aligo amut para iman amti itau tauta. Gini ni fwet sa zani gina guinai zani iman zo amti, gima pus na sakan ha kana size mid na tauta bumisite guma zo amti gisagan kuturan samoro zan man ma amti. Dispensers sa taigui si mama chai pagu pagu lo gof jazas sa kada diha guahana di si size esta benti unun ha amti gi un diha ha lunis esta mat betnis di si alas otso gi egan esta las dosi mega ni man mafatu pagu para ma amti ti sinya man ma azure gi mediku pues guiza mas pipia. Put i megai pagu man malalagu, man malagu, man ma amti gi gumat zo amti. Gi matsu estina sakan in baba gumat zo amti gi zahagat zan zonia. Sa megai gi tau tauta ma espipia siha i man zo amti. Lo guaha na biahi na tisinya esta ta amti sa taza amut, taza babena. Makat masoda i amut zan mas Sesu mengasau i manzo amti. An man e amut, man matsotsoma ni federaris. Makat kada diha ta e kunguk i piniti niha i manzo amti. Mangakasau. Kada ta menti i litegzan, esta tisinya mangwentus. Esta bentina tisinya man matu. Kinsi anyos man voluntario ham sa esti ta lilii para i na mega gi manzo amti esta man mapus esta na esti na tiningu malilingu zan lokwi i amut gi mapus na mes into tuhun i edzak put amut apprenticeship program guaha otsu ni man hobin man edzak gas zo amti lourdes manglonia and i mat tu gizaguam za i manzo amti gweni mentras i in tetsegui esti na guaha adulantu, tisinya ta na famta zangintaza i amut, za ma distrosa i tano. Maila za ta amut tati i diritsota. Amut para i hinam lota. Nihi ta fanatsu, nihi ta protehi, nihi ta na para i distrosu. Na hongesta, si zus masi.
Half a day, Senators. My name is Desiree Taimango Ventura, and I'm a professor at our local college. And I have been critiquing, responding to, and writing about the buildup for the past 10 years. But today I'm here in a different capacity. Instead of looking for rhetorical fallacies or the misuse of rhetorical strategies, I am speaking on behalf of over 30 Chamorro women who could not be here tonight. in addition to myself. These are women from my local social circles of mothers, women from my faith study group and Bible study, as well as sisters of the Guahan diaspora. They could not be here today because some of them have recently delivered children or are caring for their young ones. Some of them are fulfilling obligations to their sick, elderly, or deceased. Others cannot be here because of distance. We want you to know that the people who are requesting your help in stopping these actions are everyday people in your community. Bankers, teachers, stay-at-home moms, musicians, farmers, and social workers. We women wear so many hats. Some of the women have asked me to testify for them today, but they have no history of activity or education on these issues. They are women without the privilege of evenings off to show up at hearings or meetings. They are women without babysitters or rides to get here. And they are often trying to keep up with how quickly these stories develop while fighting the morbid inclination to be fatalistic in the face of huge threats to their home. And despite some of them lacking formal training or history of activism, they are all prompted by a simple truth. It is a truth inherited from their mothers and grandmothers. That simple truth is that they know with every bone in their body that their heritage is important and worth protecting. They want it intact for their children and grandchildren. While my testimonies of past have often cited violations in law or formal procedures, I have been asked to tell you today that some of them do not know anything about the law or the formal agreements you have made with the U.S. military. They don't know anything about NEPA or preservation laws. A couple of them are still afraid to talk openly about feelings of betrayal and disappointment with the U.S. military. But they work to process and make sense of these feelings every day. Many of you were supported by these women during the election season because they hoped for leaders that would know their hearts and the unspoken fears that keep them up at night. They trusted that when it came to issues like this, issues that sometimes overwhelmed them, they could count on you to stand up for them. They, we, are counting on you. These women wake up to stories in the news that overwhelm them every day with this looming buildup. Their worries sit like heavy balls in the pits of their stomach, and to function and be of help to the people that need them, they sometimes have to pretend these things aren't happening at all. They try very hard to move about their day, fulfilling their obligations as Chamorro women, and those are many. But as they chase after their kids, cook, go to work, attend nightly rosaries, and care for their parents, these stories lurk in the dark corners of their mind, filling them with heartache. They are simply trying to sustain and exist. They are trying to carry on the immediate demands of maintaining Chamorro families, and it has become even far harder to do knowing that larger forces are at work constantly to destroy important parts of who they are. Our land and access to our ancient sites play powerful roles in helping us perpetuate a cultural identity in our children. We are asking that as we engage in these smaller daily tasks of preservation, you assume the role of preserving us on a legislative level and within political discussions, or that you continue to. Some of these women have never been to Latexan or seen Lati and ancient villages in real life. Others have spent a lot of time in all of these sacred places and know firsthand that we cannot let them go. But together, they are all here in spirit with the same hope. They dream of a generation of Chamorro children born into an era of self-knowledge and confidence. 
How can this era come if we keep giving away and destroying sacred sites? Preserving these spaces will help us to make that dream a reality. We are asking for your assistance in giving our children more stories of empowerment. We are asking your help in protecting what is left. Our children have inherited enough stories of loss, contamination, destruction, and political oppression. We resolve to continue living and thriving as resilient young Chamorro matriarchs, but we are counting on you to help remind the U.S. military that being resilient is not a reason to justify continually hurting us. We respectfully ask that you work to pause, continue to work to pause the construction and clearing of sacred land related to the proposed firing range. And I would like to read the names of the women that could not be here tonight. Denise Santos, Ramona Nelson, Jessica Nangauta, who found it in her to come, right? Uh, Patricia Quintanidza Kier, Candice Nicole Primitiva Algi Munya, Allison Timinglo Kwasai, Jessica Sinicolis Janicek, Bernadita Deloria Benton, Keisha Borja Kichichu Calvo, Taylor Kier Peer, Christina Nelson Ilarmo, Miracle Mugol, Ursula Herrera, Shannon Siguenza, Desiree Sablon Young, Sheena Afflegui, Tanya Chargloff Timinglo, Christine Bauman, Odessa Sinicolis, Melissa Tovez, Simone Bollinger, Maria Cristobal Calori, Jante Perez de Leon, Callan Perez, Tiara Naputi, Carissa Flores, Joni Sarasola, Shannon and Chauvin McManus, and Teresita Perez, all of whom are here in spirit tonight. Thank you. Hafade, Guahusi Maria, Hernandez. Um, I'm here today in support of Resolution 164-35. Um, I want to thank all of you up there for your courage and your strength in speaking out against um, the U.S. empire. Um, it just makes sense that everybody up there are, they're all strong women, so uh, I really appreciate your time and, and staying back and listening to all of us. And I know everybody is busy with their families too, so everybody here too, uh, thank you all for staying back. Um, I'm a descendant of the Latexan landowners. Um, I was a young girl, I was four or five around the time that Latexan was taken for, the, it was the second time Latexan was taken from my family. Um, so the land was condemned in the 60s, deemed excess in the 90s. And instead of being returned to the original landowners, it was transferred to the federal government for a wildlife refuge. Um, my Auntie Kat and my mom, uh, my aunties and uncles, they always brought the kids to all of the protests. And we actually did overnight campouts. And those of you in the 90s probably remember the newspaper articles. We have probably hundreds that we've kept. Um, so they brought us along to all of that. We would hop the fence, uh, camp out overnight, and it was just, it actually strangely became a great bonding activity, breaking the law. <laughs> um, so I treasure my memories growing up at La Texan, and um, I just remember as a little girl waking up to the salty sea air and stepping out on the wet sand, uh, stepping out of our, our tents. And our family matriarchs would always be making food, and you'd smell banyalas agat, and it, it'd just be a really amazing family um, occasion. But it wasn't all, um, you know, sunshine. We, we were dealing with daily harassment from wildlife refuge staff, um, who would, they would fight, I mean, they would really uh, do whatever they could to egg on my family members, and 
sometimes it would lead to physical fights. Um, and so it's just, they, it kind of, they kind of became villains in our story. Um, and I just remember walking down long gravel roads as a five-year-old, just looking up at my family members with their protest signs, they're all yelling and angry. And so that passion has definitely followed me to this day and that nostalgia follows me to this day. And although I didn't build a home or establish a life at La Texan, like my Tata and my Nan and Biha, my aunts and uncles, my, aunt, my family, they have so many memories of just, I mean, there were so many just turtles nesting in that area. And um, it was home. It was really home to my elders. And so, I'm now in my 30s and it's all coming full circle. I'm continuing to fight alongside them. But in this process of, of getting to know the issues involved surrounding the, firing range, surrounding the firing range, I've come to find that, you know, this issue is much, much larger than my family. So regardless of your stance on the firing range, whether you're build up, uh, pro built up, anti build up, we all need clean water. That's something that we can all agree on. Our main water source is at risk. The range is set to be built on our northern lens aquifer, which provides 80 to 90% of our island drinking water. We're being told that our aquifer will be protected because that water will be distributed through wells that will undergo rigorous monitoring as DOD will follow the Safe Drinking Water Act. In a roundtable meeting held in late 2017, the military's environmental compliance program manager, Gino Tisan, the person overseeing effects to the aquifer during this project, said he was unaware that the Safe Drinking Water Act does not cover all the chemicals the military releases during its exercises. In other words, there are chemicals that the military is releasing that are not covered under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And we see historically that the Department of Defense has a history of contamination on this island. The Northern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District brought to light numerous accounts of water and soil contamination reports and studies on Guam as a result of military development. Water is life. We're seeing the impacts of man-made chemicals on the health of our community in present day. Why would we want to move forward with another project that has the potential to permanently contaminate our main water source. When we heard that the range would be built above our aquifer, that should have been enough to throw out this location. Was it not enough that the military's own studies, the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement stated there would be, quote, more adverse effects from operations under Alternative 5, which is Northwest Field and Tailalo. Than, and, than under any other alternative. In other studies conducted by the military, it was determined that due to noise, costs, land use, incompatibility, and impact to the community as a result of the fi firing range near Latexan, Alternative 5 was, quote, not considered to be a reasonable alternative, even with a smaller surface danger zone footprint. The military conducted three studies that said Northwest Field is the most harmful Gov Guam input indicated Northwest Field as the worst choice, and community input has been that North, Northwest Field as a location of the range is too harmful to the environment and to our culture. There are five existing firing ranges on island, and the reason that they want to have it all in one location is simply for military convenience. So we're throwing out our culture and our heritage for military convenience. So we need to take a look at all of this and find a better solution. The military also does not have a history in being stewards of historic properties. According to the Government Accountability Office's latest report released just on June 19 of this year, the Department of Defense, quote, has shown a lackadaisical performance in execution of this duty, end quote in regard to it being tasked as a steward of historic properties. It is lackadaisical, it is careless. 
This is a report that came out June 19. In 2017, Guam State Historic Preservation Officer Linda Uggen provided significant findings pointing out that her office previously indicated Northwest Field as the least favored al alternative for the firing range, given the location had multiple historic historical sites. She stated that 269 properties were counted and recorded, and of those sites, 63 were determined eligible for listing on the National Registry of Historic Places. Why would we place an institution that is known for being careless in managing historic properties in a position of handling our historic properties? The artifacts removed from Maga Village, there are still no plans for what is gonna be done with them. And there's dialogue in the media about how they're in a cultural repository. They're not in a cultural repository. There still are no plans as to what is going to be done with them. Despite the efforts of lawmakers and members of the community in 2017 that resulted in the passage of Resolution 228-34, which called for the pause in the firing range complex, DOD still moved forward with construction activities. And here we are almost two years down the road, still urging for a pause as more and more ancient settlements and historic artifacts are found where surveys were supposedly done. When will this insanity end? It is up to you as our leaders and our Magahaga to really take a strong stand in the best interests of the community. It's just unbelievable that the project has made it this far with all of the negatives that have been thrown out about it. I also want to note that Admiral Chatfield, in response to the public outcry, has always seemed to respond by saying, well, the Marines are coming, the range is needed. Um, it's violating, it's, it's, it's basically DOD says that it's committed to living up to the four pillars of one Guam, green Guam, a net negative footprint, and being culturally sensitive. But they're really just offering us lip service. Their decision to steamroll over the voices of the community, local leaders, and legislation makes it clear once again that the partnership that they claim to have with our community is conditional and their interests will always come first before community interests. So I ask that all of you please continue to hold DOD accountable for the continued disrespect to our sacred sites, our culture, our land, our water, and heritage, and take a strong stand in protecting our home. And I just want to end with an anecdote. I, um, there's a journalist who I'm friends with who had, was t saying kind of an an anecdote um, on social media, and he mentioned that there is a property, it's called the Atentano property, that was donated to the Preservation Trust by a multinational corporation. And they owned the land for decades. They originally wanted to develop their operation there, but in their first phase of construction, the bulldozer came across a laddie site. And this corporation called off their plans and the land sat idle for many years before it was given to the Preservation Trust. So there are institutions that understand the sanctity of our lands and that make that decision to hold off on, on doing construction when it's gonna have terrible impacts to the community. So there are ethical institutions like that and um, you know, it's just kind of like connecting that story to present day. The military could just have that sense in them to understand that this means a lot to our community um, but they continue to steamroll over our voices. So, um, like others have said, we will continue to stand behind you uh, in moving forward. And we just thank you again for your courage and for um, standing up for our community. Thank you. Sainamasi. Hafidi, Senators. Guahu Simaneco Flores. I'm um, a founding member of Persehila Texan, Saver City, and I'm an active member of Independent Guahan, and I'm also a descendant 
of um, a family who lost over 30 hectares of land in Taragi and Anapsin um, as a result of uh, eminent domain after World War II. Um, I'd like to thank all of, I'd like to thank those of you who are here to listen to us tonight. It's already been over three hours of testimony. Thank you for engaging our people on such a critical matter that will directly and ultimately impact our health, safety, and future as an island people. Thank you, Senator Nelson and the 12 other senators who co-sponsored Resolution 164-35. This is a great resolution that timelines the challenges of this buildup, including the pending Earth Justice lawsuit with organizations from the Northern Marianas Islands. I hope the committee and the core rapidly move this resolution forward and onto the session floor. I also implore all senators, including the two who did not co-sponsor this resolution, to vote to pass it immediately. And I'd also um, like to, you know, aside from thanking you all for staying back after a very uh, intense special session, I, it's also unfortunate that uh, for an issue that's so important to our community that more senators didn't stay back. So thank you for, and your staff for staying back and listening to all of us. And also to all the people who are, who have been waiting patiently to testify and for listening to all of us. Thank you all. And for our Sina who have made time to be here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of us are here, but because of the strength and love of our ancestors and because of the work of, of the people who are here speaking tonight. Um, I also, um, I want to thank all of you senators who continue to um, fight this historic injustice, contamination, destruction, and desecration directly resulting from the enduring burden of the U.S. military presence here in Guam. Um, many points were made, and um, some of them will be a little repetitive, but I really think it emphasizes the concern and the public outcry and just how critical this issue is. So um, I apologize if I'm, if, if, I've made, if I'm repeating some of the points that were made earlier. Um, um, you know, we, we know that we do not have to make any arguments today to establish that the military is not a good community partner, not a good steward of the land and waters, and not a caretaker of our heritage and culture. The U.S. military has historically demonstrated and continues to prove and continues to provide us with the evidence themselves, and the numbers don't lie. More than 100 military toxic waste sites in Guam alone now multiple generations suffering from cancers and several other serious illnesses resulting from nuclear radiation, Agent Orange, PFAS, PFA, PDBs, and other contaminants, countless drums of hazardous chemicals constantly being found, 500 tons of contaminated soil from, from one recent fuel leak, hundreds of unexploded ordnance, the growing list of sites that have never been cleaned up or restored, the villages we know where all the sick people are living. Um, I, would you know, I would like to thank Senator Perez and Senator Terlai for their efforts to address this contamination. But now with the buildup, we're dealing with a lot more. Um, now we're dealing with the clearing of over 1,219 acres of limestone uh, jungles, permanent loss and destruction. The alarming increasing frequency of inadvertent discoveries of historic properties. Now nine recent discoveries just reported by the Rear Admiral. 14 sites that have already been destroyed and removed via um, data recovery. Our ancestral remains and the evidence of their lives forever desecrated. The 6,719,190 ammunitions that will be fired over our northern lens aquifer. The nearly one millions of gallons of water a day they intend to extract from the aquifer. The nearly five generations of families who continue to fight for the return of the land that was taken against their free will. The more than 273 days that Latexan will be close to these families and to the public. The latest GAO report, the growing number of endangered species, violence against our people. These numbers don't lie. Now compound these numbers with the thousands and thousands of residents and in Okinawa, Japan, and surrounding islands who continue to protest the presence of the US military in their homelands because of numerous heinous crimes and acts of violence, because of dangerous accidents, because of radi radioactive contamination, environmental destruction and desecration, their healthy safety and future also at risk. 
The U.S. military presence there is a violation of the rights of the people of Okinawa and Japan. The buildup here is a violation of the inalienable rights of the indigenous Chamorro people. Our rights. Perabaihu protehi zanhu defendi i hinengi i kutura i lenguahi i airi i hanam zanitaun Chamorro. And also a deterrent to our right to self-determination. This continued militarization and contamination of our lands is a, is a deterrent to our right to self-determination. Moreover, these violations, these are violations of human rights, rights to clean water, rights to safe food, rights to our medicine, rights to peace and safety. We can also look as close as the Marshall Islands. We can look at other territories, Vieques, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii, for numerous other examples in which the military has proven and continues to prove that it does not hold environmental protection or historic preservation as its priority. Nor is, it the, nor is the military always transparent, or, or nor do they take responsibility for the damage that they are responsible for. Again, we don't have to look for much more evidence to prove th that, that they are not the best community partners. Um, I, I humbly submit to you today a printout of the online petition for Protehi La Texan Save Ritidian. This petition has been online for um, over a year, and we presented this printout to the governor um, at a meeting last week with over 26 local organizations. So this is the exact same copy we presented to the governor. At the time, it had 12,400 signatures. Right before this hearing, the signatures were up to 13,873. These are thousands of people who live here in Guam, thousands of Chamorros who live in the diaspora all around the world who, do not, who cannot be here to fight, who do not want to see these lands be destroyed. Thousands of people, hundreds of people now in Okinawa and Japan who see this as also aligned with their issues. People from all over the world are now looking at this as an international issue and we have close to 14,000 signatures to prove that. Um, so I, I'm happy to submit this to you today as well as over 70 pages of comments and we will provide um, a PDF with the updated number of signatures and comments uh, to your committee. I just wanted to go over some of the points contained into the, in the petition and we're really happy that some of it is similar to the language in the resolution. So Protegi La Texan Save Ritidian um, opposes the degradation and militarization of native lands. We, the Guam-based group Protege La Texan Save La City, and our direct action group dedicated to the protection of natural and cultural resources in all sites identified for DOD live, fire, live firing training on Guam. We oppose the establishment of any military firing range and align our efforts with our regional movements working to prevent environmental degradation and destruction on sacred and native land. Our work promotes the continued pursuit for re the return of ancestral lands. And some of the points we talk about uh, that we're protesting um, include um, the ongoing earth justice lawsuit. Um, seeking Malika, to set, yes. Please forgive me. Okay, now I'm, I'm just uh, gonna go no, really no, no, quick. No, 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 I don't wanna rush you. Uh -huh. Wait, can we just pause for a couple of minutes because they need to recycle the feed, Okay. you know, of this. And so yep. just give us a couple of minutes and then okay, so maybe, maybe perhaps you can start speaker. back with the, um, the petitions that you have and then move forward. Okay, Thank thanks, you. Vice Speaker. So we'll take a quick recess.